Please, please rise for the invocation to be given by Mr. Pacino. Roundabout way to get here. Uh, let us pray. First, let us thank all medical personnel and all caretakers for, it, for attending to the sick and the ailing. Theirs is a tough job administering to those in need. We ask that God give them the strength, courage, fortitude, patience, and insight to do their job. Now let us turn to the business we are here. We ask for wisdom, knowledge, and understanding as we gather here to make our decisions. We are here to understand what is best, what is the issues in front of us. We are here to comprehend ideas, even those that are different from ours. We are here to be tolerant and respectful of each other. We are here to make wise and thoughtful decisions. We are here to determine what is best for the town, both the citizens of Reading and the world. We wish to help as we move forward. We ask for a clear picture of our town, our country, and even our world as we make our decisions. With that picture, we will be able to apply, these, apply this to our decisions and make them better. I want to close with something that was said on the uh, House floor, in the Senate, the, uh, s the Congress, by Speaker Boehner, and I'm going to paraphrase here. We all ask and frankly expect that we agree without being disagreeable. In turn, we pledge to help each other to carry out our duties. Our doors should always be open. Fellow members, some may think that what we do here is showboating, shadow boxing, and ego trips. But let me tell you, it is work. It is a grind as we should be striving to preserve the things that we hold dear. Every time we come here, we should try to plant good seeds, cultivate the ground, and take care of the pest. And then with patience, some sacrifice, and God's grace, there will be a harvest. Praise the Lord, amen. And now the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now, in the past, at this point, we have always administered the oath of office to new members and newly reelected members. That is no longer a requirement, but I do think it's a nice tradition. If you would like to partake, please rise at this point, and I will administer the oath of office to our brand new town meeting members and newly elected members. Please raise your right hand. I solemnly swear, I solemnly swear that I will faithfully and impartially, I will faithfully and impartially discharge and perform all the duties incumbent on me as a town meeting member according to the best of my ability and understanding agreeably to the Constitution and laws of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and to the Charter and Bylaws of the Town of Reading. So help me God. Well, congratulations and welcome. At this point, the uh, clerk will read the warrant. To any of the constables of the town of Reading, greetings. In the name of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, you are hereby required to notify and warn the inhabitants of the town of Reading qualified to vote in the local elections and town affairs to meet in the following place designated for the eight precincts in said town meeting. Dr. Enstraminga moves that we dispense with the further reading. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? Motion carries. By the virtue of this warrant, on February 27, 2015, notified and warned the inhabitants of the town of Reading, qualified to vote in town elections and town affairs, to meet at the place and at the time specified by posting the attested copies to the town meeting warrant in the following public places within the town of Reading. Warren Killam School, 
Reading Police Station, Reading Municipal Light Department, Joshua Eaton School, Parker Middle School, Barrows School, Birch Meadow School, Wood End School, and Town Hall. To date of the posting being not less than 14 days prior to April 27, 2015, and the date of the town meeting in this warrant. I also caused the posting of the warrant to be published on the Town of Reading website on February 27, 2015. Just one second. Another tradition we have, before we begin, I go through some of the very basic rules just so the new people can understand and some of the other people can be refreshed. When recognized, please wait until you have the microphone before speaking. In addition to being heard in the hall, we want you to be heard on RCTV as well. The um, tapes from the cable cast could be used in verifying the official report. Before speaking, please state your name and precinct. Members are limited to no more than 10 minutes. The chair will call on people roughly in the order that they raise their hands, taking those that have not yet spoken first. Non-members may speak, but only after members have first had the opportunity to do so. Non-member proponents of a particular motion may speak with permission of the body. Remember to stay away from personal attacks or, for the most part, any personal references. We are here to discuss issues and not personalities. After debate has proceeded for a while, we may have someone move the previous question or simply move the question. That is a call for debate to end. That motion itself is non-debatable, and we would proceed directly to the issue of stopping debate. That takes a two-thirds vote. The chair will not recognize that motion from a person who has just spoken. In other words, if you want to move the question and stop debate, that must be the only thing you have risen for. Amendments. We may have people offer amendments to motions on the floor. These will be accepted. For simplicity's sake, the chair will only allow two proposed amendments on the floor at any one time. Once those are disposed of, others may be entertained. If the amendments are money amounts, the highest amount will be taken first. If it carries, the second will not be necessary. The same applies for lengths of time, with the longest taking first. Otherwise, the most recently moved amendment is taken first. If this becomes an issue later and an explanation is necessary, we'll do it at that time. Town meeting members must be sitting in the lower portion of the hall if they want to be recognized as town meeting members and have their votes counted. Instructional motions. Article 3 is placed on the warrant by the Board of Selectmen and calls for instructional motions. These motions instruct various boards or individuals to do whatever the motion calls for. Technically, state law does not allow motions to be made when the subject matter does not first appear in the warrant. We have traditionally been al allowed them here because they are non-binding. Our bylaws stipulate that all main motions, which these are, must be made in writing. Additionally, I ask they be written on an 8.5 by 11 sheet containing nothing but the motion. Otherwise, they're likely to be lost. The chair will enforce that rule tonight. In addition, I would ask that whenever practical, all such motions be presented to the moderator at the beginning of each night's session. At some convenient point, the chair will inform the body what intended instructional motions have been presented. This is done in fairness to those being instructed and deserve some semblance of notice, and to town meeting members who, when making a decision as to whether or not to adjourn for the evening, should know what business is still before them. Unlike the regular articles, members have no idea what type of instructional motions will be made. There's often confusion with two particular motions, indefinite postponement and tabling. Let me give you a brief explanation of the difference. Indefinite postponement is a motion asking the body not to not to vote for a particular motion during the life of this town meeting. Although it is thought of not so much as a vote against a particular issue, but rather a postponement, the result is the same. Voting in favor of indefinite postponement has the same result as voting against the main motion. If indefinite postponement carries, the main motion is defeated. A motion to indefinitely postpone is debatable. Tabling is used for another purpose altogether. Tabling temporarily puts aside a motion. It can be brought up by any again, any time during the meeting by anyone before the meeting adjourns sine die. That motion is not debatable, although the chair will allow a brief explanation as to why the motion to table has been made. Adjournment. There are two types of adjournment. At the end of an evening, we adjourn to a time certain. Tonight, for instance, when we're done for the evening, we presumably will adjourn until Thursday. When we are done with the business of town meeting, we adjourn sine die, which translates to without day. In other words, the meeting is complete. Please turn off all cell phones or at least use non-audible alarms. 
Finally, I'd like to explain how things are likely to proceed over the next few hours and the next few days. Tonight, we'll begin with Article 2 of the annual meeting warrant, and I've just been told we should cover in, uh, Article 4 as well before we go into the special meeting. Um, at as close to 8 o'clock as we can, we will uh, temporarily adjourn the annual meeting and then open the special meeting. We'll spend the evening working on that warrant until finished. Assuming we have time, we'll go back into the annual meeting. We'll probably start Thursday evening with the budget, Article 20. We like to do the budget all in one night, so if we start the night with it, it works better. Once that's completed, we'll go back to where we left off and work on whatever is left. I believe we are now ready to begin uh, the state of the town. Dr. Ensminger? Mr. Moderator, request permission to speak longer than 10 minutes. The, the state of town by town charter allows that, so proceed. Mr. Moderator, fellow town meeting members, citizens of Reading. It's a great honor and a privilege to speak to you tonight about the state of the town. There is much good news to report, but we must also talk tonight about the fiscal challenges we will face going forward. The state of our town is thus both positive but guarded. Positive because we have a well-functioning government that has run efficiently and frugally that has dedicated employees who work as a team with their managers and that prides itself on maintaining a high level of service to the public. Guarded because storm clouds are gathering on Reading's financial future, despite having a management team that is the envy of other towns. That team, led by town manager Bob Lelishur, his predecessor, Pete Heckenbleckner, and school superintendent John Doherty, have helped us weather past financial turbulence through shrewd negotiation of health care and special education costs, multi-year fiscal planning, cooperative union negotiations, and uncanny ability to underspend budgets and underpredict revenues. However, future predicted increases in certain costs not under the town's control threaten to create a future imbalance between services and the revenues needed to sustain them. There are three major areas I'd like to cover this evening. First, a review of our key achievements as a town over the last year. Second, a summary of the town's fiscal outlook going forward. And third, some options and strategies for proactively managing our future finances. So let's go on to the year in review. Just prior to our 2014 annual town meeting, Reading welcomed its new state senator, Jason Lewis of Winchester. Reading is very fortunate to have a strong local legislative team that also includes representatives Brad Jones and Jim Dwyer. I must say that Representative Lewis's constituent service to Reading over the last year has been very good. He has worked proactively with town officials to address issues ranging from traffic hazard mitigation to the curbing of opioid uh, use in our community. Welcome, Senator Lewis. As part of the annual goal setting process for the town manager, the Board of Selectmen discussed and then laid the foundation for a look at the community's future in the year 2020 by holding a department head retreat in mid-2014, which resulted in the formation of four Reading 2020 working groups. The focus of these four groups is as follows. The first group, community partners, and this group is going to explore the resources available in the community beyond those that are formally a part of town government. These resources may be leveraged in creating and or delivering services to the community in a public-private partnership. Second major area, services and performance measurement. To, to inventory the services provided by town government to the community and come up with ways to measure and evaluate how important those services are and if they are being delivered efficiently. This effort is meant to lead into a discussion about the community partners group listed above. The MAPC has already presented a draft services and performance measurement assessment and that happened at our April 14th meeting of this year. Third area, communication. To evaluate and improve communication that is, one, internal to the organization, two, between volunteer boards and committees, and three, with the general public. A major step in fulfilling this task has just been accomplished 
with the hiring of our first administrative services director, who will also, pursuant to our amended charter, serve as our town ombudsman. And the fourth area, strategic planning, to study real estate projects, long-term community planning, town policies, and town infrastructure. Excellent progress has been made to date on all four of these areas. However, the magnitude of the task list above will take at least one more year to complete. Second area, Reading uh, also concluded very important union negotiations in 2014. Reading Town employees have worked in tandem with the town for many years during the good times and bad times. During periods of austerity over the last 25 years, they have agreed to four years of salary freezes. Our town employees are currently paying a percentage of their health care premiums that is comparable to what is paid by many private sector employees. I salute their spirit of cooperation and the work they do for the citizens of Reading on a daily basis. In 2014, the town manager and his staff successfully negotiated new three-year contracts with each of the town's six bargaining units. I was struck by the town manager's straightforward negotiating style with the unions, which was to put all the cards on the table up front, tell the unions what the town could afford, ask them about their needs, and then help both sides get to yes. There was a minimum of positional bargaining during the whole process by both sides. Hats off to Bob Leilishur and the unions for a job well done. In 2014, the selectmen sought the services of a new town council. Four strong finalists were interviewed by the board and the law firm of Mieres and <laughs> Harrington was selected in June. Ray Mieres has become a familiar face with town meeting over the last 10 months as he has helped us navigate the intricacies of a complete rewrite of our zoning bylaws and several important amendments to the Reading Home Rule Charter. We hired Ray's firm in part because of their expertise in zoning, and he proved to be a rock of support to the Zoning Advisory Committee. The Charter Committee and Town Meeting and their lengthy deliberations over zoning and charter changes. Thanks to everyone, especially you folks out in the seats, who uh, took the time over the last year and several town meetings to slog through a lot of uh, unglamorous but very necessary work. Ray tells me that the Attorney General begged him not to allow Reading to hold any more special town meetings as a result. <laughs> the remainder of my year in review will summarize some of the highlight accomplishments of the various town departments. Time only permits me to report a fraction of the numerous tasks accomplished by our town staff in 2014. So in advance, I apologize for those efforts I was not able to mention. In early 2014, local voters approved a second debt exclusion for the public library renovation and expansion project. Total project costs came in at $18.4 million, $13.4 million of which will be paid from the tax levy, and about $5 million of which will be paid by a state grant. The year 2014 was spent on planning and designing both the new library building and a temporary location to be used over what was expected to be about 18 months of construction. An extensive and careful public procurement process was conducted for the temporary location and a project manager, project architect, and finally a general contractor were hired for the renovation. The library building committee and town staff worked closely together to ensure that the final results are something the community will show off with pride for decades to come and which will be a warm home for the wor world-class library staff and their many happy patrons. In December 2014, the old library site was turned over to the general contractor and site work began shortly afterwards. The project is expected to be completed by early summer 2016 and as of this writing is both on time and on budget. Congratulations to the library trustees and staff for making the temporary space so welcoming for their patrons and getting the library renovations off on the right foot. Next, the Department of Public Works, also known as the Colossus of Roads, has been very busy in 2014. Our engineering division has been extremely active with approximately 25 ongoing proje projects between fiscal year 14 and 15, including outside agency project oversight and inspection monitoring on West Street regarding work done by Mass DOT, National Grid, and the MWRA. 
In addition, the town continued with its aggressive road paving program with the paving or repair of 26 streets, construction of a new sidewalk on Vine Street, and ongoing repairs to a number of sidewalks throughout town. The long-awaited paving and signalization of West Street has just begun its two-year construction schedule. The first phase of the project will reconstruct West Street from Summer Street South to Woburn Street, and construction will move south from there in subsequent phases to the Woburn City Line. Sidewalks, curving, and several traffic signals will be added, and the Summer Willow West Street intersection will be substantially reconfigured for safety purposes. A reminder to town meeting, the state is footing 90% of the capital cost of this project. The DT DPW also initiated a trial customer service program entitled See Click Fix, where residents can, via online or mobile applications, initiate requests for services or report on issues that need departmental attention. Items reported via See Click Fix include potholes, missing signs, hanging tree limbs, and overgrown sidewalks. Over 100 requests were received, tracked, and completed using C Click Fix by the end of 2014. This year, the DPW and the Board of Selectmen will review the efficacy of C Click Fix and decide whether or not to subscribe to it permanently and extend it to other town departments. After 10 years of negotiations with Mass DOT, the Main Street Franklin Street intersection, the most accident prone intersection in the town, and one of the worst in the state, was finally reconfigured in mid-2014 to, to add protected left turn lanes and crosswalks. The tip of the hat goes to former town meeting member Fred Van Magnus and to state reps Squire and Jones and to Senator Lewis for their dogged persistence in getting this important project expedited at Mass DOT. I am pleased to report that there has been a 30% reduction in reportable accidents at this intersection since these improvements were made. Finally, the DPW initiated a major water capital improvement program in 2014 that will only further enhance the town's water quality and infrastructure for generations to come. In addition, discussions have been initiated with the town of North Reading and the MWRA regarding the potential of wheeling water through Reading into North Reading. Reading's water distribution infrastructure is more than adequate to handle this project. MWRA is projected to continue its aggressive capital infrastructure improvement program in hopes of this potential becoming reality in the not too distant future. So stay, stay tuned for that. Uh, not to be outdone, our police and fire departments and the Reading Public Safety Dispatchers have also had a busy year. In late 2014, Sergeant Detective Mark D. Sagala was promoted to the newly created position of Deputy Police Chief. Numerous other police department badge pinnings and promotions, too many to mention in this brief report, also occurred in 2014. I must admit that these ceremonies to me are uh, really one of the fun parts of being a selectman and, and very enjoyable. Police department led by Chief Cormier continued to be an active member of the Reading Coalition Against Substance Abuse, or RACASA, and was awarded grant funding that enables the department to conduct alcohol compliance checks. In the spring of 2014, the school resource officer conducted opiate prevention workshops with RACASA in all freshman decisions classes, underage drinking prevention training in all 11th grade health issues classes, and promotion of safe parties at 11th and 12th grade student assemblies, whose goal is to reduce underage drinking and impaired driving. The police department's detective division has worked closely with RACASA to be trained in the implementation of alcohol compliance checks throughout the community. Most of these checks result in 100% compliance by our local liquor licensees. However, when a local liquor store was observed by alert Reading police officers to be selling alcoholic beverages to underage teens on multiple occasions, and this is following a first offense, a complaint was lodged with the Board of Selectmen. The board, after hearing the officer's testimony, imposed an additional 90-day suspension on the owner. This suspension was substantially upheld by the State Alcoholic Beverage Control Commission, one of the longest liquor store suspensions ever upheld by that agency. 
The Reading Public Safety Dispatchers provide, through communications, a lifeline for the community, police officers, and firefighters. Dispatchers receive requests for information and services, then triage those requests based on available resources and disseminate those requests to the emergency personnel in the field. Dispatchers also greet the public entering the police station and provide a valuable service to our community. The Board of Selectmen is very pleased that the FinCom has included our requested two additional telecommunicator positions in the FY16 budget, which will provide greater margins of safety for all of our residents. Now, not to be outdone, the Reading Fire Department, not to be outdone by the police and the dispatchers, and this is a good one, provided what had to be one of the most heartwarming stories of 2014. Lieutenant Dwyer, firefighters Daniel Cahoon, Paul Roy, Scott Mayette, and John Keogh were recognized in 2014 for their creative efforts in performing an elevator rescue of a mother and two small children. The firefighters determined the most efficient way to extricate the family would be to use two ladders. Firefighters saw that Kaylin, a four-year-old child, was scared and they wanted to lessen the child's anxiety. Firefighter John Keel learned that Kalen was a fan of the Disney movie Frozen, so firefighter Scott Myatt brought the music up on his iPhone and they all sang Let It Go to calm the girl as she was removed from the elevator. This story tells you everything you need to know about the skills and the resourcefulness of our first responders and the leadership of the fire department, Chief Burns. Quietly, the Finance and Administrative Services Department of the Town Hall conduct the internal operational business of town government, somewhat unsung heroes. Working closely with the school department, they handle efficiently the in intricacies of employee and retiree HR relationships. The town's technology infrastructure is the envy of many neighborhood communities as information flows readily to all departments so that effective decisions might be made. The recent borrowing for the library's excluded debt for 10 years at 1.5% interest showed the investment community's view of the financial strength of our town's operations. In the last year, our town clerk, Laura Gemmy, has successfully managed four elections and a record five town meetings. In our most recent election, she reacted quickly and seamlessly to arrange for manual counting of two precincts ballots when their primary and backup machines failed. Great work, Laura. <laughs> Finally, I'd like to summarize some of the key accomplishments of our public services department, headed by Assistant Town Manager Gene Delios and assisted by Community Development Director Jesse Wilson and Community Services Director John Fudo. Many of you know John Fudo is the quiet leader behind the town's incredible recreational programs, which are the envy of nearly every community in the state. John has been tasked with weaving his program building schools skills into the areas of human elder services, veterans, public health, and recreation. Moving forward, we expect a lot of synergy among our boards and committees in these areas as we offer community-wide programs for you and your fellow residents. Gene and Jesse do the work of a much larger, much larger planning department. They were instrumental in developing Reading's new complete streets and bicycle and pedestrian plan. The complete streets concept is sponsored by the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, or MAPC, formalizes the community's desire to have streets that are safe for users, uh, users of all ages and abilities. For example, Complete Streets emphasizes the needs of children to walk or bicycle to school safely, promote safety for older adults through signal timing at intersections for safe street crossings, and helps people with disabilities by a fully accessible curb ramps at intersections. In later 2013, our planning division requested assistance from the MAPC with the development of a townwide bicycle and pedestrian plan. A final draft plan was presented to and adopted by the Board of Selectmen in July 2014. As part of the Bicycle and Pedestrian Plan, MAPC worked with the planning staff to develop a complete streets policy. This policy was vetted through the Park and Traffic Transportation Task Force, say that one three times, mm -hmm. and adopted by the Board of Selectmen in the July of 2014. 
Another uh, notable public services, this is for the former Community Services Department under a new name, Public Services. Another one of their projects in 2014 was the start of an economic development action plan. With the assistance of from Professor Barry Bluestone of Northeastern University's School of Public Policy and Urban Affairs, the economic development plan began with an initial assessment known as the Economic Development Self-Assessment Tool, or EDSAT. This tool, which was executed in the spring of 2014 with a focus group consisting of members of Reading businesses and government, evaluated Reading's strengths and weaknesses as it relates to economic prosperity. Using a variety of criteria, the EDSAT measured Reading's ability to compete with other communities for potential future development. The final EDSAT report was issued in July of 2014. With this information, and a better understanding of some of Reading's current economic challenges. The planning division requested the assistance of the MAPC to cre create an economic development action plan. This is putting the EDSAT results to concrete use. This plan will build off of EDSAT as well as the priority mapping project, which was completed in 2014. The economic development action plan will focus on four areas in Reading identified as regionally significant in the priority mapping project. Uh, this is primarily areas down the industrial zone, uh, the area near the depot where the, uh, the current storage facility is, and uh, some areas off of South Main Street. And uh, a lot of it's theoretically what could be done here, uh, but they did hold a meeting uh, to vet a number of development concepts not very long ago in the uh, Pleasant Street Center. Uh, the result will be an action plan that includes development recommendations based on the market analysis and innovative modeling that will identify the amount of commercial square footage, number of housing units, percentage of total development, et cetera, that the site could support. This plan development is ongoing with two well-attended public forums having been held in 2015 and will be completed later in the year. Now let's uh, conclude with the financial road ahead. I'm gonna conclude my talk by elaborating more fully on the issue I touched on briefly at the beginning, the guarded future state of our town finances due to an imbalance of available revenues versus needed service. My discussion will only be an overview of the subject. I will leave a fuller facts and figures discussion for the finance committee who will be addressing you in a few minutes. The town and schools have, since the passage of Proposition 2.5 in 1980, been required to do more with less. By reputation, Reading delivers both a high quality and volume of services giving, given the funding that is available. We understand the daily challenge of improving, and if that were not ingrained upon the passage of Prop 2 and a half, it surely is now. We use an extensive and public planning process that looks ahead several years, and we adapt thoughtfully to the rapidly changing present. The planning process, combined with prudent reactions, allows us to del deliver a good value. Financial reserves continue to be at an all-time high. Significant ongoing investment in infrastructure has improved the condition of buildings and equipment over the past decade, which has in turn lowered operating costs. Standard & Poor's recently increased Reading's credit rating to AAA, which is higher than that of either the federal or the state governments. Employees and retirees have contributed significantly with increased out-of-pocket expenses in order to keep health insurance premium increases lower. Wage growth has been very modest, not even keeping place pace with inflation. These savings have in turn led to fewer layoffs, which has allowed strong service levels during a period when the community demand for services has actually increased, as is typical in the municipal sector during an economic downturn. Staff responded well, and measures of customer satisfaction remain high. However well managed our expenses have been in the past, the two greatest threats to balancing our future budgets are first, cost increases outside the town's control, and second, an increasing reliance on property taxes for town revenues. Two of the greatest uncontrollable cost increases are those in accommodated costs such as health care expenses and special education expenses. The outlook for accommodated costs is difficult to forecast because of the national uncertainty on health insurance. 
we have a TIG at about 5% annually for FY18, which will certainly be higher than expected revenues. And while the school department has made great strides in controlling special ed costs uh, by increasing our in-district offerings for students, the number of students needing special ed services can fluctuate considerably year to year and unpredictably. Also, a future labor negotiation on salary and benefits, which we do control, will need to respect the level of available funds. On the revenue side, communities are becoming increasingly more self-reliant on total sources of revenue, local sources of revenue. In Reading, this has been driven by lagging state aid, plus the effects of one operating override and two debt exclusions over the last 12 years. Since FY03, state aid to Reading as a percentage of overall revenues has declined from 24% to 16%. State aid forecast at $13.6 million for next year would need to increase by another $6.5 million in order to regain FY03 share of the revenues. Other local revenues have not even kept up with our property tax growth, let alone made up for any relative decline in state aid. The bottom line is that revenue growth looks to have settled in, settled in at or near the 3% level for FY18. And there are no obvious new revenue sources of any significance on the horizon, although we are assiduously trying to get uh, new development in town. That's, a, that's further out. That's further out. That's years away on any massive scale. Given the 2.9 increase, 2.9% increase in available revenues and higher projected accommodating costs of 4.4%. There is enough funding for a 2.75% increase in town and school operating budgets for fiscal year 16. This 2.75% is the lowest increase in operating budgets during the last four fiscal years. These budgets average at, were an average of 3.6% increase from FY13 to FY15. The town and school budgets, even at this lower rate of increase, are able to maintain core services, but not quite level services in the face of increasing demand. The use of several one-time sources of funding, grants on the town side and both grants and a heavier use of offsetting revolving funds on the school side, allow for core services to prote be protected for one more year. However, faced with the same revenues and accommodated costs in FY17, it appears that each side will need to make reductions to these core services a year from now, unless other cost savings are found. Reading should be proud of how the town and schools work together and spend efficiently. The Board of Selectmen and the School Committee are the town's two chief policy setting boards. It is my goal as chairman in 2015 to work across the aisle with the School Committee to explore all possible economies of scale in combining our operations as a prelude to the FY17 budget planning season. It is important that a good measure of progress be made in achieving such cost reductions before any measures such as operational overrides are considered by the town. This will be an open and transparent process with ample opportunity for all stakeholders to comment. As a show of solidarity, Acting School Committee Chair Chuck Robinson has agreed to share the podium with me at this time and add his own comments in support of this process. Mr. Robinson. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, and good evening, town meeting members. Uh, and I thank you for the uh, privilege to share the podium tonight. As, as you will see on Thursday night, the school committee and school department is very thankful for the budget that will be presented to town meeting. And we appreciate all the discussion and collaboration that went into forming this budget. It's imperative that we, we remain unified and on the, on the same page because nothing positive, nothing, nothing positive and sustainable moves forward otherwise and the community's children lose out. And surely this is an outcome that nobody wants to see. <coughs> As Dr. Ens Ensimer mentioned, since the passage of the last Proposition 2.5 override, both the town and the schools 
have been continually asked to do more with less. This ultimately becomes an uncomfortable discussion of wants versus needs, and the fact of the matter is our ever-changing society has shifted what would have previously been called wants over to the needs category. Unfortunately, societal needs and changes sometimes move faster than the process of thoughtful and thorough planning of local governments to obtain the necessary resources. <coughs> Dr. Rensimer also mentions our financial services being at, uh, at an, uh, excuse me, our financial reserves being at an all-time high. To expand on this, I would say that the town and the schools need to be very judicious in their use of reserves as this is done with great purpose and thorough and thoughtful discussion prior to doing so. I sincerely hope that gone are the days of cutting capital and maintenance, spending and depleting our bank accounts to sustain day-to-day -day operations. Frankly, today's better approach coupled with good management and su has sustained us longer than anyone predicted since the last Proposition two and a half override. I agree that Reading should be proud of the collaboration be between town, schools, and staff and elected officials as it is the, the envy of many communities. I gladly accept the invitation to ask the school committee to evaluate and implement where appropriate any economies of scale and, uh, and agree that this would commence immediately following this town meeting as it will give us a baseline to begin the FY17 budget discussion, and it, it will also have vetted additional savings as it, that can be deployed elsewhere. We also need to continue to expedite the discussion of wants versus needs. If we expect the town and schools and staff to continue to deliver the excellent product currently being offered, we as elected leaders need to lead more of these discussions in the community. These discussions might be difficult, but they are necessary in order to give us and give the staffs the resources they need to make successful, continue be, uh, make Reading continue being great. Thank you. Dr. Rensmeyer. Last year, thank you. Chuck, very much. Last year, Chairman Arena and the town manager stated that the town of Reading was nearing a significant decision point about the imbalance between the quality and amount of services desired versus what is sustainably affordable. As soon as we turn our attention to the FY17 budget planning process next summer, we will know whether the time has arrived for additional revenues or a reduction in core services. Thank you for allowing to speak to you tonight. And uh, let's get on with town meeting. Thank you very much. Yep. Yep. <laughs> but wait, there's more. <laughs> These things. Okay. Uh, we're going to have an interactive exercise. I think these have served us very well in the past. And uh, so to launch the conversation we've been talking about, uh, just want to point out, recent financial forum discussions have indeed centered around the services funding imbalance, and the town and school governments, if you just heard, will focus in 2015 on further streamlining their respective service costs via what we call intra-regionalization within the town. Economic redevelopment and writing will add new growth revenue, uh, but in future years at any significant level. Free cash is our savings account and cannot be used in perpetuity to balance annual budgets. So it's time to begin another conversation with town meeting and Reading voters, and it begins tonight. So we're going to ask you a series of questions. If you would have your handhelds ready. I think the way we'll work this is uh, we don't have that little countdown thing available anymore. That was from the MAPC. So we'll give you about 15 seconds, and I'll announce the close of the window of voting. Um, the first question. In recent years, Reading has been using free cash to proactively balance the town and school budgets. Currently, FinCom policy suggests the cash reserve should remain at or above 5%, or about $4 million. FinCom has discussed raising this minimum. In future years, how much free cash should you set aside as untouchable? Choice one, lower. 
say three, three to four percent. Choice two, maintain the five percent level. Choice three, higher, seven to eight percent. Okay, it's time to vote. Okay, about another five seconds. Okay, the results are 77% keep it about 5%. Second place, 15% raise it to 7 to 8. Thank you. Next question. Question 2. Average annual regeneration of free cash in both the past 5 and 10 years has been 2.5 million. This regeneration will likely, I won't, won't just say may, will likely be lower at FY15 and beyond. Free cash is needed for mid-year expenses, witness the snow budget, as well as we recently to balance operating budgets. Going forward, how much free cash should be used annually to balance the town and school budgets? Choice one, none. Choice two, one to 500,000. Choice three, 500,000 to one million. Choice four, one to 1.5 million. Choice five, 1.5 to two million. Choice six, over two million. Time to vote. Give it another five seconds. Okay, all votes in. Let's look at the tally. Okay, um, looks like the winner is between one, one and a half, followed closely by uh, 500K to one million. And that is below the current level of uh, subsidy, interestingly. Uh, it's right, at the 37% is right up where we are now, 1.5 million. Uh, only 20% want to subsidize at a higher level, and about 13% want to subsidize at a lower level. Thank you for that. Okay, next question. Do you agree, true or disagree, false, with the following statement? A Proposition 2.5 operational override will be needed to balance future town and school budgets. Uh, a, true, B, false. Another five seconds. Okay. Two to one, true. Thank you. Next question. In which fiscal year do you believe a proposition two and a half operational override question should be placed on the April ballot? A, should have been FY16. <laughs> B, FY17. C, FY18. D, FY19 or later. E, never. Okay, about another five seconds. Okay, time. Winner is FY17 followed by uh, FY18. And 22% vote of never. Okay, now this one is interesting. Uh, this is a chart of the uh, FinCom peer communities in, north in the north of Boston residential market. And it plots on the x-axis uh, housing value and on the y-axis uh, tax bill. And uh, there's a, a line with a pretty good R squared fit there for those of you who understand regression <laughs> analysis. That's a good fit to the data there. Uh, Reading is right about on that line in the uh, lower left quadrant uh, with average taxes of about 6,500 on the average house value of 450,000. Uh, we're matched very closely by North Andover. Linfield is further to the right and uh, Winchester is almost off the charts with an average uh, home value of uh, 800,000 and average taxes of just over 10,000. Uh, you'll notice that some of our sister communities at the bottom tend to cluster uh, at a lower level of housing, both housing value and average uh, taxes. Uh, just one point I want to make, y we could talk about average housing values, or we could talk about average taxables, but I think there's no such thing as an average taxpayer. Uh, 
Uh, taxpayers are in two flavors, those that can afford to pay extra taxes and those that can't. And in the latter category, I know a number of people, uh, they're good friends of mine, typically widows living on fixed incomes, the house is paid in full, and the biggest component of their expense every year is property tax. So they're having a, they would have a hard time absorbing an increase. So that's, that's one constituency I'm going to keep in mind. But there are many others, too. So uh, let's move on to the next question. Question five. The annual property tax bill for the average value home in Reading is currently below a trend line of peer communities. Next fall, it will edge closer with the excluded library debt, but still fall below. The following question is about town and school services. What would you like to see? A, less services. B, the same amount of services. C, more services. D, I don't know yet. Let's vote. Another five seconds or so. Okay, let's take a look. 54% the same amount of services, 26% more services. Uh, only 9% for less and 10% I don't know. <laughs> All right, let's go on to, I think there's two more questions. Question six. The average property tax bill for the average value home in Reading is currently about $6,500. What is, this may be the last. What is the maximum increase in this annual property tax bill, the average property tax bill, that you would support in a Prop 2.5 operational override? A, none. B, 2.5% increase, or about 160 on the average home. 5% increase, 325 per year increase. 7.5%, 490. And 10%, $650. And F, more than 10%. So please vote. Okay, about another five seconds. Okay, results are 35% uh, voted for a Five percent, uh, twenty-four percent for two and a half percent, and nineteen percent for uh, none. Uh, let's see, only a total of twenty-one percent wanted to go higher than five percent. That would be the summation here. All right, all this data is going to be saved. It's 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 excellent first step. Uh, thank you for taking the time to do that, and it's been a pleasure speaking to you tonight. At this point, the uh, clickers will be collected by our checkers, so we can have them ready. Also, Dr. Ensminger moves that we lay the substance of Article 2 on the table. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, the motion carries. Dr. Ensminger moves that we take Article 4 from the table. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, motion carries. Article 4, let's see. We have uh, just a little asher. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. We'll do Article 4 from the annual town meeting before jumping into the special town meeting. Um, for those new members of town meeting, uh, there are two types of votes taken on capital. One is to put things into a capital plan, and then later you vote on whether you want to spend money on these items. So Article 4 is simply putting items into a capital plan. Earlier this evening, the Finance Committee met. Uh, there is one change for what's in your printed material. For the high school retaining wall, we had put 620,000 in as somewhat of a placeholder. Um, the actual number came in at 500,000, so that'll be a little bit lower. Um, so everything you see in your uh, warrant book will be the same, except that number is $120,000 lower. Um, some of these items will be discussed in the special town meeting. There's a million dollar birch meadow field lighting project. Uh, we reduced the project as a whole by 800,000 and moved a portion of that up to the current year. There's the half a million dollar retaining wall. These both will be part of the special town meeting and then some smaller uh, capital items. The uh, 
uh, the auditors and Wall Street lawyers like us to show one year in advance also. So there's FY16. Um, partic of particular note is uh, in the enterprise funds, we're um, actually moving a, a very large Batchelder Road sewer station uh, up from FY16 to FY15. We'll deal with that in a future article. I don't know if there's any questions. Again, this is just putting things into a capital plan, which then allows town meeting to discuss and vote on them. Uh, Ms. Perry, uh, Green Crime Report. Yes, ma'am. On March 25th, 2015, FinCom met and voted 800 to approve the subject matter of this article. And we reconvened tonight as the number got slightly adjusted and voted 700 to approve this article. Further discussion? None appearing. Are we ready for the vote? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. Mr. Ensminger moves that we uh, adjourn the annual town meeting until the conclusion of the special town meeting. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? Motion carries. The annual meeting stands adjourned. We now call the special town meeting into order. Dr. Ensminger moves that we dispense with the reading of the warrant. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? Motion carries. Business under Article 1. Dr. Ensminger moves that we uh, put the uh, substance of Article 1 on the table. Is there a second? Second, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, motion carries. Business under Article 2, Mr. Halsey moves to uh, table the substance of Article 2. Is there a second? Second, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, motion carries. Business under Article 3, Mr. Arena moves that we uh, lay the motion, the uh, substance of Article 3 on the table. Is there a second? Second, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, motion carries, it's laid on the table. Um, Article 4, Mr. Lasher. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'll also be joined shortly, shortly by uh, John Pudo, our uh, Community Services Director, who's winding his way through the back. Um, I want to take you a little quick history tour. Again, I know we have some new town meeting members. Um, about seven years ago, a Birch Meadow master plan was designed by staff and eventually accepted by the Board of Selectmen and five years ago, town meeting approved the project with funding scheduled to begin in FY15. In 2013, I asked um, the selectmen if we could take a fresh look at it. I'll tell you one of the three reasons we moved to Reading was Imagination Station, but my kids are older now, so. Um, the selectmen agreed, and, the, and further, they wanted to delegate it to the rec committee to get some input on this. Um, and so we pushed the funding out a couple of years because we knew it would take some time for the Recreation Committee to, to do that work. And Rich Han, the chair of Recreation Committee, is here this evening. Uh, last year in the summer and then on into the fall, I met with both these gentlemen and I know they met um, formally with the Rec Committee. And one of the conclusions everyone reached very quickly was the plan that was approved by town meeting in 2010 had $1.1 million in it to move the fields and to do some other field work, I'll call it. Um, my recollection was um, there was a discussion of changing the angles by 15 degrees. There were too many softballs and baseballs going into Birch Meadow Drive. Of course, I said wooden bats instead of aluminum bats would be cheaper, but anyways, that was the design. And um, cooler heads prevailed and we realized for a million dollars out of three million dollars, it was not sensible to go move in the field. So once that was taken off the table as an option, um, the project, if you wish it to, could be divided into two pieces. There's the field lighting, which is in front of you, and then there's the remainder of the scope of the project that John Futa will talk about um, very shortly. Um, to give you a little bit of background that the Finance Committee heard a month or so ago, uh, as of last November, I had every intention of coming to a uh, January town meeting and asking for the first three fields to be lit um, from free cash. Um, once I found out that the school committee had requested modular classroom discussion and that we were going to have another town meeting, I didn't think it was appropriate to bring forth the field lighting until that discussion was, was finished, as to me, 
the modular classrooms were a higher priority. Uh, in March, the Finance Committee and ultimately town meeting first saw this request. Uh, a number of things had changed since November. First of all, that giant snowflake. Um, because of the snow, um, as you'll see in a future article, our snow and ice budget is $850,000 over budget. We don't quite need that much free cash because we found some other savings. But we took a pretty big bite out of free cash that certainly we didn't plan on doing last November. Um, once, the, once the decision and the needle kind of shifted from free cash to debt, it made perfect sense, at least to me, to include all five fields. Um, that, that's probably the preference anyways. If you're going to do a project, you like to do it all at once. You like to have consistency in equipment and approach. And generally, you get some kind of economies of scale. I was not prepared to ask for a million of free cash at a January town meeting, but I might have asked for 600000 but this is probably, it, things worked out for the best. It's, it's best to do the project in one piece, and it's certainly best to, to debt finance it. Hopefully you can see that. I'll uh, name off the fields. It's also printed up in your book. The uh, request would have originally included uh, softball field um, and lit softball fields. We're working on naming. We're going to sell the naming rights. Um, and then also um, Morton Field. The two new additions would be Turf 2 at the high school and then the Little League field right behind the cafeteria. So we'll, we'll keep this map for further discussions also. I want to spend a couple minutes talking about specifically the recreation revolving fund because there's been some discussion in the community and I want to make sure everyone understands the rules, especially with the town account in here. Um, fees must be set relative to approximate costs of running a program. So you cannot set a fee for anything, but let's just pick recreation based on what the other towns charge or what your own market will bear. You must set the maximum fee to cover the program's costs. So if the town would pay $20 for something that only costs 15, you can't put five in your pocket. You're not supposed to do it that way. You're supposed to charge the maximum fee to allocate to all the costs. Right now, Recreation Committee on Purpose has set their fees low as a service to the community. Um, I estimate, and it's just a guess, that we're about $100,000 below our costs. So to be sure, that $100,000 right now is coming out of the general fund every year. And it's doing that um, in some cases in an obvious way, in some cases less so. All expenses in recreation are paid by the revolving fund. That's why in the recreation divisions, bu divisions budget, you don't see expenses. You see wages, but you don't see expenses. The fund pays them all directly. Uh, to the extent we have employees, a portion of their wages are indirectly paid at the end of the year when there's a surplus turn back to free cash. Um, there has never been an effort to uh, charge, if you will, for benefits that those employees might be charged. And we usually figure 30 to 40 percent. So there's some amount that the fees are not covering now. That's an important thing to keep in mind. Um, Sharon told me to promise that the, say that the Mass DOR does not let us pay for this project with fees. So capital and debt costs may not be paid directly with fees. However, <laughs> um, if you're going to increase field hours and field usage, you're certainly going to gather more fees. We don't believe we need any additional recreation staff for that. We will certainly incur a few more expenses. But by and large, this additional fee revenue without any change in the fee structure just rolls in the door. The Recreation Committee um, at the last meeting that I attended in March absolutely is very open to the idea that they may raise fees. And those come in two flavors with, I think, probably the more interesting flavor being a more direct cost on the nighttime field users. So what could happen here is the Recreation Committee could raise fees plus there's additional users and indirectly, in case the state is listening, that could pay for the debt in the capital. <laughs> um, but that's only, again, because the fees as they're currently set up are artificially low, if you will. They don't pay the cost of the full program. Um, just to finish this off, in July of 2015, if this article is approved, um, from a financial standpoint, we'll borrow the money temporarily, just like we have for the library on and off. 
uh, a year from now, June of 2016, is when we're scheduled to do the final borrowing for the library. We'll add this and any other articles that we might discuss soon in. Um, it's important that you know that to actually issue debt is fairly expensive. It costs you fifty to $75,000. When you're already going to issue debt, and add in more projects, there's no additional cost. It's still a fixed cost of 50 to 75. So it would have been more difficult for me to stand up in front of you and say, I think we should just do this one project because that's a pretty big expense. But we already have other debt plan, including some uh, $3.5 million water main debt. Um, this isn't a, a, a difficult thing. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to John Feuder to walk you uh, into the future. Mr. Feuder. Thanks, Bob, and thanks, Mr. Moderator. Um, bear with me. I very rarely use notes to make presentations. I usually just uh, go with the heart and come off the cuff, so I'm going to read a little bit tonight. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is John Feudal. I'm the Community Services Director for the town. Uh, I've been with the town for 13 years. Uh, many of you know me over my last uh, 12 years as the Recreation Director. I just want to give you my perspective of the project, where we're headed. Um, and some of the process that we're gonna be going through. Um, as our town manager just uh, mentioned to you so eloquently that we'll be looking for some funding for a light project to light or relight uh, five of our athletic fields in town at the Birch Meadow Complex. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about opportunity and impact um, that that will have for the town of Reading. And again, talk a little bit about that process. Um, we have the opportunity to increase field usage by one and a half fields by doing this project. Um, as I mentioned before, I've been here with the town for 13 years. This has been an ongoing uh, concern for our residents and our users um, every year. And we haven't quite, quite found a way to, um, can you hear me okay? Um, we haven't quite found a way to really solve that issue. And I, the two ways I've always thought about solving it was either adding lights or going synthetic um, with our fields. So we have the opportunity to save um, some su significant money um, by doing the project all at the same time as Bob mentioned, and I think uh, both our school committee and Board of Selectmen rep mentioned the economies of scale. There's certainly uh, an opportunity to take advantage of that um, with this particular project. Um, I want to just jump back. Um, earlier this month, I stood right over there uh, against the stage and listened to Chris Heron, um, a former Celtic and a former outstanding basketball player from uh, this region, speak about his addiction or his battle with addiction of substance abuse. We had about 500 people um, sitting in this auditorium. Um, he gave accounts of his early age when it started, uh, some of the things that they were doing, and you could hear a pin drop in the room. It was captivating, people were interested, and it had significant impact. It had impact on people walking out of the auditorium that night, and it had significant impact on me uh, to try to seize opportunity to give our residents the best we can give them. And I made a promised to myself leaving that night that I would do everything I could to salvage any opportunity that came before me or before the Recreation Committee that I thought would benefit our community. Um, I'm not saying that putting lights up at a field is going to stop the drug issue, because if it did, I think we'd put lights everywhere. Um, but I, I, th I think the larger scale picture is trying to create deterrence for um, not only our, our youth, but our young adults. Um, to get off the couch, uh, to get out of their houses, to be promoting positive activity. Uh, one of our biggest battles is, is certainly drug and alcohol, but we also have another battle with the Xbox and the uh, iPads. And those of you with children understand that battle that goes on every day. Um, so to me, that is impact. Um, impact to me is 3,000 people that use our fields each night. If you cruise around the complex tonight, you probably saw every single field um, well used by our youth organizations and adult organizations across the board. Um, impact to me is taking participants off a wait list or adding games or adding practices or adding uh, activity. Uh, those are all positives that we can take away from um, this type of a project. And impact to me is something as simple as playing in a safe environment where ill-advised telephone poles and overhanging wires um, aren't in the aren't in the playing field. Um, as many of you know, we have that situation. Um, so these are opportunities that provide us with chances to make impacts on so many people directly or indirectly. Um, 
During the spring, uh, after we leave here tonight, hopefully the Board of Selectmen will embark on neighborhood discussions. Um, they'll be looking to hear from neighbors about impacts, answer questions, uh, address any concerns, feel confident that our very capable Board of Selectmen will listen, mitigate, and try to resolve any concern that our neighbors have about the project. Um, lights are a scary thing for anybody, and, and we know that. And we are not looking to press forward until we've gone through those concerns and we have a full understanding of what's on the table. Uh, we have other lighted facilities in this community and we found ways to make it work and we will continue to find ways to make this project work. So um, rest assured that that will be taken care of. Um, from there in June and July, we will be hopefully going through the procurement process and getting this, um, this project bid out so we can begin um, over the summertime and hopefully have the first phase of it done by uh, the fall of 2015, which is right around the corner. Uh, Bob had mentioned in his remarks about a survey that was coming. Um, I expect the Birch Meadow survey to be available perhaps at the end of, at the end of May or at the beginning of June. Uh, that survey will solicit demographic use of the park. It'll solicit uh, parking and traffic flow. Uh, it'll also solicit information on what folks are looking for in town, whether it's bathrooms, pavilions, uh, concession facilities, what we're looking for at that, uh, at that particular location, uh, the Birch Meadow Complex. Uh, we'll use this data to help us guide the rest of our planning. Um, the Birch Meadow Master Plan to me is a living document and it's always evolving and always changing. We will need the data from our, our users and our constituents to let us know what they're looking for and help us actually set priorities going forward. Once the survey is completed, uh, the updated plan will go to the Board of Selectmen and we'll have yet another public hearing. Uh, we're hoping to do that sometime in the winter and I dare mention the word winter in front of the public that just came out of a horrible winter. I thought you might throw eggs at me. Uh, but we hope to bring that back and we hope to be back here actually in April 2016 uh, with, a requ with a request and a solid plan to finish the Birch Meadow Master Plan and have it completed. Um, I'm happy to take any questions you have and thank you for your time. Income report, Mr. Mall. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. FinCom has uh, been hit by a little bit of a, a bug. I apologize. Um, Finance Committee recommends this article by a vote of 8-0-0 at their meeting on March 25th. Is there further discussion? Yes, Mr. D'Addario. Well, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Ron D'Addario, Precinct 6. First, I'd like to thank Sean uh, and the rec uh, department for the great job you guys do for, for the, when I get the magazines, see all that's in there. So it's extremely impressive. So thank you, John. John, just two quick things. With the lighting, I would just ask that, uh, you, you don't even have to get up, John. I know you're gonna agree. <laughs> uh, John, I'm just asking that with the lighting that I read in the warrant that they're gonna be the most efficient and I would ask that you ensure that and that maybe uh, some of the lighting might have a solar assist on it, if possible. And then the only other thing is that they might have timers so that we don't have the lights on and nobody in there, John. So thank you, and I'm certainly going to vote for this. Thank you. Further discussion? <coughs> yes, Mr. Downing. Uh, Jack Downing, Precinct 7, and a longtime former Recreation Committee member. I, I fully understand the need for the fields. It's been a longstanding issue, not enough fields, uh, and I think the turf fields have helped a lot. But I think we're going down the wrong path here. We've got something backwards. We're going to do this survey um, uh, later in the year to talk about Phase 2. But this is exactly the same kind of problem that happened with the putting the lights on on the uh, stadium field. Um, what happened was there was no public input. There was no input from the neighbors. They met at the multi-purpose um, room and they, the school committee voted it in without any discussion. So what happened was there was not so much extra light, 
but a lot of extra noise at times of the day when people aren't used to it. I really think the people of Precinct 7 that surround this entire complex deserve to have an opportunity to discuss what's going to happen and this whole issue of going, uh, what is it, deeper into the day or whatever, what those times would be, and also so that they understand that it's not so much the light but the, but the, but the sound and coming at a time of the day. I really think you ought to have this community meeting and especially a discussion with the abutters to this long before you come here and ask for money because once we give you the money, it's a fait accompli. It's just gonna happen. Like you said, you're gonna start the procurement process right away and there won't be any public input. I think we need the public input first, come back in the fall and we can do it then. I realize it may not be the right thing for the for the financing, to put it under debt, but say la vie, I really think the people need to hear what's gonna happen, when it's gonna happen, long before, because it was, it was our former superintendent had a terrible time with few neighbors who were really upset with the noise, calling him every single day. You don't want that. So, um, um, it, it, I really think we're doing this too early. Come back in the fall after you've had an opportunity to discuss this with the neighbors and also when you have a better sense of what phase two is going to be all about. So I'm going to vote no on this, and, th and those are my reasons why. Further discussion? Yes. Yes, Mr. O'Neill. John O'Neill, Precinct 4. Uh, pretty much echo Mr. Downey's concerns and have a few of my own. Uh, Process-wise, I mean, I, I, re I read this around four or five times just to make sure I was getting it right. They were talking about doing something and then asking people what they think about it. I just think that that's just a, the backwards way of do, doing it. Not that there wasn't a master plan before, and I understand that, but there was a process that got put on hold, and they weren't talking about lights at five fields. I mean, I coached in soccer for 17 years. I mean, I had uh, practices at Barrow's tennis court, the Pillum, you know, parking lot, you know, shared it with four other teams on the back, you know, uh, the top of Parker. So I, I fully appreciate in that you're getting all sorts of demands and we need new recreational space. So I have no, no problem with that. I do have a problem with the, you know, the process, the timeline that we're going about here. Uh, people in, at Birch Meadow, they get, they get hit with everything. You know, they get the three schools, they get the recreational activities. You're talking about, also, I mean, some of the things you have in here, three to, three to five hours. I know I, I refereed a youth soccer game last week and started at six. Got in at plenty of time, so I'm thinking, well, this must be, we must be talking about 10 to, to midnight. You know, as far as time, the only way you could possibly get three to five hours more for most of the year, maybe you can get a couple of hours. That's about it. And then I'm also concerned about a cost in it that's not mentioned here about, we also have a problem with overuse of fields and the need to take fields offline like they, you know, like if you really want to extend the use even for non-turf as well as the turf field, we're gonna have a problem with them I'm sure in the future as well. That's gonna be a cost and it's gonna be a cost to additional maintenance of the fields and so you know, when you talk about getting the equivalent of a field and a half, I wish we had, a, you don't get the equivalent of a field and a half without having another field and a half, is what I would say. But my, my main concern, the reason why I will vote no is because of the process too. Not that whether or not, you know, I would vote it in, in favor of it, you know, after the process, but right now I can't support it. Mr. Lasher. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, the Recreation Committee clearly hasn't taken a position on this, but at the last meeting um, with John, we discussed either 9 or 10 p.m. curfew. So this isn't a question of being midnight. Um, and in the, you know, in the late fall, you do have hours where it's getting dark at 4 o'clock. You can't play. So 9 o'clock, there's your five hours. It's not five hours every night. It's a maximum of adding five hours. Um, in terms of the process, I guess it really comes down to a pretty simple viewpoint. There's field lighting for all five fields. That is now something that is desired 
you know, whether it's three fields or five. To me, the real question will be, is that all you do? You know, do we do a master plan and we find out, you know, we need to do a little bit of fixing up of some of the fields, but uh, it's just fine. The extra lighting was really what we needed. Or you go back to the master plan from five to seven years ago and there are things like a $900,000 pavilion and other I issues and other items in there that would draw in people. So that's really a legitimate community discussion. Um, the selectmen and recreation staff has al have already met with some of the abutters. So it's not a question of not doing anything for another couple of months. They've, that's already happened. But the real question is what else does the community want in terms of recreational opportunities, services, uh, do parents, you know, if you remember the old Imagination Station, on a hot day, aside from scalding your kid on the metal slide, there was nowhere for a parent to sit that wasn't like the Sahara Desert. So, you know, a nice pavilion, um, you know, could be a money maker if run properly. If you look at how North Reading does Ipswich River Park, for instance, there's some nice options. So I think the lighting discussion, at least in my mind, is very separate from what do you do. And that clearly ref does require a lot of neighborhood input, a lot of community input. Ms. Webb? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Town meeting, um, Elaine Webb, Precinct 1. Could you, Bob, go back to the previous slide that really mapped out the initial part of the process from the master plan? I think it's maybe the first one. So. Um, I just wanted to clarify that the, the lighting has been part of the process of this discussion as the, from 2008-2009 master plan. So that was always, so there's been a lot of discussion and vetting. I haven't personally attended those meetings. I know that other members of the school committee were also on uh, some of that master planning. So I just wanted to verify that it's been part of this I, process. I, I don't believe the Little League field behind the cafeteria was ever mentioned. Yeah, it was not done and never mentioned. So that's new. And then turf two, you know, should be modernized. If I understand part of the issues with turf two is that lighting was sort of, uh, I'll say, second hand um, and to allow us to have what we have right now and that possibly th that existing capital as it is would be redeployed. Maybe you could um, clarify that a little bit. Mr. Pito. Uh, thank you. Um, the current lights at Turf 2 are inadequate to play any kind of high school um, lacrosse game just because we actually tried to mitigate that issue uh, about four years ago by adding uh, some auxiliary lights there and it still hasn't got to the level in which they need. Um, I, I think you asked, and I'm sorry I was getting up when you were asked the question, but I think you asked about recapitalizing those lights that are there. Yeah, what, what's happening to that? equipment is that scrap or being reused uh, personally what I'd like to see happen with that is to have it moved over to Castine field in which we're using a very very um, inefficient and uh, yellow style light for the skating area I think it would those would serve as um, very nice swap outs for those so we would try to recapitalize those if we can and um, I guess I just wanted to you know I, my understanding with regard to the field usage when I read this was we're going to be able to provide a diff additional usage, um, meet the needs of the recreation, the youth teams, and uh, maybe the schools, but that the hours weren't going to change at this point. So you're getting that additional usage. I think Bob just clarified by basically being able to play during the times when it's dark that the fields are currently available to teams. So that's true. That correct. Currently, we have some fields that are not lit, obviously, now. Those will be go fall into the same category where they'll be open till 9 or 10 o'clock at night to be determined at a later date. Uh, Turf 2 is currently open till 10 o'clock each evening, as is the uh, lighted softball field. So that would continue to be uh, lit every evening uh, going forward, both spring, summer, and fall. I guess I just, I think uh, it seems that we, at, we on the school committee and just town meeting, we, we heard, we hear, um, all the time that we don't have enough of this resource. This has been something that in the last 15, 20 years on town meeting, this is it continually comes up. So I think the opportunity that we have now to provide that additional resource and take this step forward is really one that we should do. And uh, I certainly resonate with uh, all of your perspectives around trying to provide resources for our youth and engage them in ways that are, that are healthy. 
and, um, and that these are ways where parents and people in the adults can be part of it, whether you're actually a parent or just an adult in, a commun in the community, perhaps if we take the additional steps beyond the lighting, it would make it something where other community members could partake. And uh, so I, I support the article. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Dave Mancuso, Precinct 4. There was an article in the Wall Street Journal today that talked about the fact that 25% of the American population has not done one thing. The state of health in our country, to me, is a, is a huge priority. We talked about increasing uh, health care costs. If we can provide more recreation opportunities, Mr. Fudo, I have to tip my cap to you. I think you do an extraordinary job. If we keep the kids active, if we can get adults active, um, to me, it just makes sense to be a stronger, healthier community. And to add a few hours on a few fields um, at this point in time, given the years that we've discussed this, uh, seems to make sense. So I'm going to vote for this article. Thank you. There's another hand, right? Yes. Mr. Lippitt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Lippitt, Precinct 7. Um, I fully support the goals of this and, the, and understand the needs for recreation. I am very concerned about the process here. This is the fourth special town meeting we've had in six months, and it's the third time I feel that something's being rushed through town meeting without good information, including key information in this case, which is information from the abutters. We have recently learned that on the zoning changes we made, we turned some unbuildable lots into buildable lots where the abutters have had no input into the fact that now a lot next to them is being a buildable lot. Uh, I don't want that to happen again, so I think I, I'm very concerned about this pattern that I see that in these special town meetings, we as town meeting members are being asked to vote quickly. We're being told that there's a rush, that there's a, uh, not a crisis, but that there's a hurry and we need to do this right away, and we don't have the full information. I think an important role of town meeting is to know what the abutters think and be able to take that into consideration in our decision. So unfortunately, at this time, I'm going to vote against this, I think, unless I hear something dramatically. Otherwise, I support the, the goals and the recreation and everything else, but I just think this process is, is seriously flawed. And I see this as a pattern, and I'm really upset about it. Uh, before continuing, one quick announcement. We still are missing seven clickers. So if anybody out there has one, there's <laughs> two of them, three. <laughs> <Four>. <laughs> Where do we turn them in? Uh, okay, Mr. Weld. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Carl Weld, Precinct 7. Um, I heard correctly that the lights that we're talking about funding are already part of a master plan that was fully vetted with public meetings and public input when the master plan was done. Mr. Lalasha? Uh, albeit many years ago. So it's not like there hasn't been any public input on putting lights at these fields. There has indeed been public input. We're just moving the installation of the lights forward in the capital plan. Correct? That's correct with the exception I mentioned. Um, of the one field. Yeah. So we've had public discussion. Abutters have had their opportunity for input. We're just moving it up in the capital plan. I think, uh, I think this is a sensible thing to do, to save uh, another 75 grand in uh, origination charges, you know, provided that public input's already been done. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes, Mr. Greenfield. Greenfield, Precinct 5. Um, could, Bob, could you clarify, um, there were comments made about, if I understood, fees covering part of the debt. Could you, could you clarify that and the degree to which they would? No. Sharon's still here. I had to check. <laughs> um, fees can't pay for the debt. 
parentheses, more free revenue is possible because we're not charging the full cost of the program. So we could raise fees and combine that with extra field usage and you could see 100,000 plus come in for this project, which could pay the debt indirectly. You're not allowed to technically, and I don't know why, it's, it's an interesting DOR ruling, but you're not allowed to charge fees based on capital costs for the program you're talking about. So it's more the, um, it's more simply, simply coming up to standard on. Uh, yes, I would say if, if, if you will, the discount costs. will go away for 10 years so that indirectly the capital cost could be met and then the recreation committee, if they will, you know, could reinstitute such a discount in the future. Right. Okay. Thank you. The um, I, I'm uh, I, I'm also going to vote against this. I I, I agree that uh, uh, something putting, being put in the master plan uh, does not mean that the townspeople that surround it today have any clue this is coming. Uh, and I think they deserve the uh, the opportunity to have input and for that to come back here. Uh, I also heard. Uh, just a short time ago, the balance between need and want. And, and I, I, don't, I didn't get good information yet about the need here. Um, I, I understand the want side, um, but I didn't, I didn't hear enough information about making this a need given all the other priorities and the challenges we're gonna have financially. Um, I would like to see this come back uh, with a little more solid package uh, with ta with uh, neighborhood input uh, to be considered again. Thank you. Yes, right here. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Peter Brown, Precinct 8. Um, I want to look at a little bit bigger picture. And this question is really more directed toward the school committee than to, you know, the Recreation Committee. When you look at that map, can you say with certainty that the new school, the, the new school isn't going to go and on any of those fields yet? Do you have, has that decision been made yet? For the preschool that we discussed, it's dead. It's it's not coming back. You can use the microphone if you're going to answer. Uh, we have a working group that's going to reevaluate uh, space needs, but at, at this point in time, that you know, there's there's no discussion about putting anything on that campus, including including here at the high school. If we were to look at this whole space together. Because the last discussion we had was it was going to possibly be sited out there in the parking lot. And uh, that was voted down by town meeting. That's right. So is there an, is there an update to, you know, the, possible sites that we're talking about? And does it include any of these spaces that we're looking at? No. Okay. Thank you. Uh, um, I just have a couple other concerns. Um, sure. In terms of a solid package, when we talk about new lighting, is it going, is, are the new lighting going, is it going to cost less money for the new lighting than the current cost to operate the lights? Um, the operational costs are entirely paid by the users, or will be. It doesn't cost the town money to operate the lights, the field users will pay that cost. Great, thank you very much. And how about in terms of energy efficiency? Um, are we talking about some alternative uh, lighting, or is it more standard? Could you speak to that? Um, John, you can feel free to up to me, update me, but generally speaking, we don't want to be on the leading edge, or they call it the bleeding edge of this uh, technology. Um, we're kind of one step behind where Major League Baseball is. We've, lo we've looked into what what level of energy efficiency, if you will, that you want. And what you want to do is stay behind where Major League Baseball is. For $2 million, we could put in much more energy efficient lights. 
but I don't know how long they would last, and I don't know what the product, what the impact of the product on the field would be. Um, what the lights we're looking at are, if you will, very traditional. Um, they're they're better than what we have for sure, but they're not necessarily the most energy efficient bulb you could put in there. But they are in terms of what people use for fields. Um, some of the football stadiums I've read are going to sort of beta test a, a higher version, if you will. It's a much higher capital cost, and if it fails, they can quickly replace it and go right back. We don't generally in Reading, when we do capital investment, we're very careful. We don't go out and buy the fanciest, newest stuff because we're not going to come back and ask you for a mulligan. So, you know, it'll be much more efficient than what's there now. It will not be as efficient as if we were a high tech company. Thank you. Well, I, I just have one more question, Mr. Moderator. Um, I frequently uh, walk in, 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 the, in the complex area. Um, it, I, I, you know, the, the fields, it's, it's great. It's wonderful, you know. They're used all the time. I, I, I'm fully supportive of that. I do, I do note that there are times when the lights on the tennis court, for example, this is an example, are on, nobody's there, nobody's playing. So I would encourage, um, and you know, I don't know if this can be controlled now with an app on your cell phone, that you know, when it's appropriate, it's late in the fall, nobody's playing tennis. You know, there's, there's more control over turning them on and turning them off when they're not being used. That's all. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Mr. Russell. I have no problem with the uh, Jack Russell Precinct 3. I have no trouble with the over, the, the big picture. I do have trouble with the small picture. I would like the top two or three reasons why delaying this to the fall and giving, having time to do all the public input, particularly the neighborhood input, and then come back here with, with, with a plan which has received all the input. Uh, and I'd just like to definitively ask the, 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 the downside for delaying this until fall. Further discussion? Mr. Belasher? Um, thank you. Um, I don't know what it's going to cost in a year. That's number one. We have a good idea. We have live bids right now. I don't know what they would be in the future. Um, to me, there is a question as to whether to go with this whole package at once or whether to do it in the two parts. To be honest with you, I think it's simpler to do it in two parts. Um, you know, if you don't think there should be field lighting, then this is an easy thing to vote no on. If you're more concerned with what goes was on, on the fields, I think, again, that's the discussion that's, that's to follow that'll take the year to discuss. Um, you know, the, the harm in not putting the lights now is simply one season or one year's worth of lights for the kids to use and the, and the young adults to use. It's not complicated. So it's cost that I don't know, and it's use of a year. You know, neither are critical factors, to be sure. Um, but I'm not sure why we would wait if we know we want lights, I guess, is, is the bottom line. Mr. Arena? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Arena, Precinct 1. Um, as I hear the dialogue tonight, it occurs to me uh, the discussion breaks down into two camps. Should we do it? And how should it be regulated, if you will? This capital, this project's going to cost what it's going to cost, whether they're on, the lights are on for 20 seconds or are on for five hours. The project cost is the project cost. What most of the complaints and concerns raised here tonight have been, how will it be? How will it accommodate the needs and wants of the neighborhood? How will it be managed in terms of its time on, hours on, et cetera? That's the subject of meetings that will come an input that will come. The real question is, do you want lighting there at all? That's the question on the floor tonight. The thorny questions being bubbled up now really go to how it gets deployed and how it gets managed. And that's the subject of a series of meetings that the board will 
conduct um, over the balance of the summer and, and into next year. So to echo Bob's point, this is really do you want them there or not? And that's an easy, that's an easy one to answer. The hard work we'll get into uh, in terms of how they get administered, how they get managed, how the abutters needs are recognized and rationalized against the uh, project capability. And that'll be the a discussion that the entire community is part of. Further discussion, Ms. O'Neill. Mary Ellen O'Neill, Precinct 4. Again, uh, I'm also a person who agrees with the overall goals of this, but I don't like the way that we've gone about this. Uh, it's been at least probably eight or nine years since we've talked to abutters about this. I don't, for, on speaking for myself as a member of town meeting, I don't want, I wouldn't want to go to neighbors and say, town meeting, me being one of those members, has decided to do this, now what do you think about this and you know, how can we uh, address your needs? I'd rather hear from them first, find out exactly what kind of lights, and did I hear correctly that the Recreation Commission has not voted on this yet? Has the Recreation Commission, has this been before the Recreation Commission? Has the Recre Recreation Commission taken a position on this? Okay, it's not in. His answer uh, was yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, further discussion. Yes. Hi, I'm Bob Connors from Precinct 4. On the special town meeting with Green Warrant right here, on page 4, the last paragraph reads, the Board of Selectmen will schedule a spring 2015 neighborhood meeting if this article is approved in order to review the field lighting project details, answer all questions, and hear any concerns. Parking, traffic, light spillage, and other impacts will be discussed. If the community has an appetite to expand the current nighttime hours of field use, that will be considered. Note that modern lighting designs feature very low light leakage, and as one can see from the picture above, this should have negligible, negligible effect, impact on the butters and neighbors. That's very clear to me, and so I would vote for this project because the means of redress for the abutters is included in this vote. So that's why I'm going to vote for this project. Let's see, right, hey, Ms. Binda. Angela Binda, Precinct 5. Um, I completely understand the desire for more field space, and I'm not opposed to lighting. I'm not going to vote in favor of this right now um, for a number of reasons. I agree that this article has been rushed through um, without input from all uh, interest in parties. For me, it's not just a matter of do you want lighting or don't you want lighting. One of the things that I'm concerned about is the fact that on the original Birch Meadow plan, um, lighting is about $150,000, and now it's a million dollars. And so I know that there are some things that have come off, but that's a, that's a, that's a large increase. It's not just do you want lighting or don't you want lighting. It's do you want lighting if it's $150,000? Do you want lighting if it's a million dollars? And that's a different question. So I think that that needs to really be thought of. Um, um, I, I also think that we need to hear from the abutters again. I, I don't think that they have been given due process. I know that there were letters that sent out. I know that something went out from you through Reading United Soccer to go to the FinCom meeting, have the supporters show up. Um, a letter went out from Reading United Soccer if, it, that was from um, Selectman Halsey telling them to come and support this. I don't know that any letter went out from town, from a Selectman, to the neighbors saying, come and voice your opinion. So I really think that there needs to be um, a parity with that. I also think that with a million dollar proposal, we do need to hear it within the larger Birch Meadow plan. Some things are coming off, there might be more things that are coming on. I don't think, I would rather wait and hear what more of the plan is. You're gonna be asking, there will be a survey that goes out. I'd like to see how this million dollar fits in. I was at the FinCom meeting, there was a comment, 
If you think this is big, wait till you see what's coming in November. Well, I'd rather wait and see what's coming in November. That's, that's how I feel about this. So it is, it is a reworking of the master plan. It's always being updated. I know you're not moving fields. That's a cost that's coming off. But this is a significant increase from about 150000 to a million for lighting. And I think that that needs to be considered. Um, I also think that this needs to be weighed against other important town concerns. Um, I've spoken to people, someone contacted me today, was having conversations, a town employee who's also a resident said that this came up and um, the people that were thinking about a million dollars were saying it's a luxury, these were their words, not mine, it's a luxury, um, it's an enhancement, and I spoke to a friend of mine who was off to a a softball game today, kids involved in sports, often softball game. I said, okay, if you were a town meeting member, what would you do? And she said, I want my street paved. That's my priority. I want my street paved. So we don't, it's, it's an increase in money. It's a significant increase in money. So that needs to be considered too. It's not 150,000, it's a million. So I think that those need to be done. I don't know that the plan is fully realized. I think that there's been some, um, conflicting and ambiguous financial scenarios that are put out. I didn't realize that you can't charge for capital. That's something I learned tonight, so I get that part of it. But there have been discussions about raising fees. If we raise fees, then we get this money. Well, that's kind of ambiguous. Um, in the letter that um, Selectman Halsey sent out, it says the project is self-funding. You did, this did come from you. Did, uh, okay, it says the project is self-funding with um, energy savings and incremental fees delivering a break-even time of under 10 years. I don't think anything I've heard has stated that it would be break-even in under 10 years and that any incremental fees would cover the cost. I think that what I've heard is that the fees would cover like the $15,000 interest. So um, I think that the financials, I'd like to see the financials a little more specific. I'd like to see that the rec commission saying, we will raise it this much. Um, when this proposal was first presented to the Board of Selectmen in November, there were some important issues that were raised where the money was coming from. There was suggestion that there be some fundraising along with a request for capital expenditure. There was a neighbor resident, neighborhood resident at that meeting who asked about parking and how that was going to be affected. And according to the minutes of the meeting, um, Selectman Arena summed up by saying that noise, lights, and traffic are issues that need to be addressed. And I think that they are issues that need to be addressed and I would like to see them addressed beforehand. So I understand the need for lighting. I'm not categorically against it. If it weren't a million dollars, then you know, I'd be more in favor of it. I'm not even opposed to a million dollars, but I'd like to see the Birch Meadow Plan. I'd like to see the neighborhood meetings happening beforehand, and I'd like a little more information on the specifics of the financials before I vote for this. Mr. Lasher. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Just to address the financial part again, if you look on that slide behind me, um, right now, fees are about $100,000 a year below costs. If the Recreation Committee raised fees by $100,000, they would be paying for all their costs, which is $100,000 more than we're getting now, which, by the way, is a million dollars divided by 10 years of principal. Then there's additional field usage generating who knows how much. John has estimated a field and a half out of five. So one could say that that would cover the interest. None of this is perfect. It's all guesswork. But I am driving home the point that fees cannot be raised to pay for this. But indirectly, they will have done that if that's what the Recreation Committee does. And in terms of your $150,000 comment, I remember in the capital plan a few years ago, there were three components of lighting, but you could only see two. One was the tennis court lighting, one was 150,000, and the third piece was in a big number which said $1.1 million for field work. So there, there was additional lighting costs in there. I don't remember the number, but it certainly didn't go from 150 to a million. 
Okay, it's one million field work includes some lighting cost, right. 150 for softball light fields. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes, on the edge, in the back? Yes. Carl Anderson, Precinct 7. Um, I'd like to make a comment on Mr. Arena's comment. Why would we buy the lights before we know the rules and regulations? You know, what if all the abutters and neighbors don't like what the rules and regulations are, then we bought the lights. I'd like to hear what's gonna happen. I mean, we have all these games that are gonna be played there, and every game has rules and regulations. I'd like to know those beforehand, especially about the noise. Uh, the last time we had the lights go on, we had uh, flag football with huge noise, with music all the time, and games that were starting at six o'clock, seven o'clock in the morning on Sundays. And I had to go, and other neighbors had to go before the school committee to complain to get the noise lowered. So I'd like to know the rules and regulations before I buy lights. Thank you. Further discussion? Mr. Bonazzoli? Moderator, James Bonzoli, Precinct 6. Um, I actually also happen to have been the uh, chair of the master plan for this area when I was on the board, which does go back a few years. But what was also interesting about this project or master planning compared to all the other parks that we were doing at the time, this one, due to its magnitude, the board did not accept when uh, the master plan committee presented. What the board asked us to do is actually, could we wait, which we waited an entire year for the committee to continue to meet, work with the neighborhood, work with each various component. So I can say with all confidence that we vetted lighting thoroughly at that point in time. What's also of interest on this one is we already have lighting on three of those five fields. What the project is to do is update those three areas that already have lighting, already have nighttime use, and add additional lighting for the softball area and lighting for the, um, the Little League field area, which uh, doesn't have lighting, but it does get some offset lighting from the parking lot for the schools. So the, Part of the use that you're looking at, it's not really an expansion of, oh my gosh, I'm expanding the use of five fields and the magnitude of, uh, of all this lighting. We're already using three of those five today. As John said, if we go out there right now, I guarantee you that whole area is pretty well lit up and very well used. And, and the noise, I would imagine, would not go beyond even the YMCA. And I know that just because that came up thoroughly when flag football was going on, when any other new use came on, the band competition when we had five different regions of, of bands come out. We have learned from some of our mistakes. So from a financial perspective, this makes sense to me that we should be moving forward. Should we ignore the, cut, uh, the neighbors? By, by no stretch of the imagination. But that's why this warrant article, we need to hold the selectmen, the rec department, to what they say is that they will be holding these public meetings and make sure the governance model around this makes sense. But we, we've already agreed to lighting folks. We've already agreed to the usage. We, we might as well continue, make them more efficient, and put a governance model around them. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Tom O'Rourke, Precinct 2. I just had two questions. If we proceed uh, with the lighting as uh, is being asked tonight, and then later something in the master plan affects, or could something in the master plan affect the location of those lights? And if so, is, is there any cost to relocate the lights? I mean, essentially, you can still use the, the lights, I would assume, but I just wanted to clarify that. Mr. Pudo. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. We actually, uh, in speaking with a couple of the companies that we've been gathering our information from it asked that same question and we're actually going to light it to a level in which poles are off of field space. So our feeling was with lighting, no matter what the activity was, we thought lighting would be a good activity. 
or a good, a good opportunity for us to, um, to have for anything. So it didn't really matter so to us. It really doesn't. So if, we, if, if, if squash becomes popular again in, in 25 years, we'll have a lighting for it. Okay, great. And then the second question was really just, uh, I would be curious. I know when we first introduced lighting, there was a fair amount of feedback. But can anyone speak to currently, do we get much feedback about the lighting that's currently there? Sure, I can, I can do that. Uh, the current lighting situation at, at the Birchmana Complex is, is somewhat um, fly by the night. We don't get a lot of uh, complaints. Uh, we'll get complaints by people, you know, obviously abusing the, the parking lots and uh, in surrounding areas, but we don't, I, as I said earlier, I've been with the town for, this is my 13th year, and I can count on probably one hand how many times I've received complaints about lights uh, right, down at the you. complex. Further discussion? Yes, Mr. Struble. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jeff Struble, Precinct 7. Um, I think um, when you say is the question, do you or do you not want to have lights here, as a member of Precinct 7 and having come here for 22 years as a uh, representative from Precinct 7, I say the honest answer is we don't know. Um, that being said, the process you're describing where you vote the money tonight and you're going to ask the community all their concerns later on. I think that that action will essentially take away the answer of no if the community says they don't want the lights because you have already voted the money for it. I'd say it's a matter of community spirit as a whole, the community of Reading. Precinct 7 is second to none in community spirit but I think you should do them the courtesy of letting them speak their mind to this body before this body votes money for this project. Um, and I would recommend that this body vote no on this. Thank you. Where's the discussion? Mr. Brown? Thank you, Ms. Moderator. Bill Brown, Precinct 7. I'm mean, Precinct 8, I'm sorry, I didn't move. Um, we've heard a lot about a master plan well, if you look at that clump of trees, it's named for Philip Welch, who had a master plan in 1930, and there was supposed to be lighting then. <laughs> Mr. Tuttle? <laughs> Mr. Tuttle? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, David Tuttle of Precinct 3, and I'm a little hesitant to step into this discussion. Um, it's clear from the dialogue that we need an operational plan for the Birch Meadow Complex that includes things possibly a, uh, an early curfew on competitive events to, to control the, the evening noise, the evening bustle, and so forth. And that's a, a fundamental uh, courtesy to the neighborhood and to the facilities. We need to manage them properly. I think there's very little question that having them light it is better than not. It's a safety issue, it's an efficiency issue, it's an operational issue. It gives you the flexibility to implement the operational plan, which is the, the key uh, deciding factor. I'm in favor of the, the lighting. Further discussion? Up on the back. Kendra Cooper, Precinct 8. Um, I have a question for John, I get a couple questions, but um, John, years ago we used to, the people who used to rent the, or pay fees for the, for the field use were not just students and, and uh, student groups. They were also companies and, and a lot of other people. Could you elaborate on who's actually paying the fees now and what percentage that is of, say, local students and, and uh, youth groups versus, um, you know, what but I don't even know if they still do that because my, stu my children are your age. <laughs> so, right. so I don't know, right. I mean, I, but I know that's what it was yeah. and, and often school committee meetings where they would talk about the fees and things. Sure, um, I can tell you that we don't, we don't do a lot of renting of our fields to out of town organizations, especially in the spring and summertime because we, 
honestly don't have the space. We dedicate our space to the in-town residents, and that's something I've become very big about uh, since I've been in town. Um, the percentage is actually 100%. I actually take the light bill, which is the least efficient way to charge them, and I just send it to them, and they pay it. Um, so that's our current process. Uh, the new process we'd be looking at would actually be able to allocate the organizations by, by use, and we'll be able to track that online, uh, which will be a very powerful tool to make us more efficient and track better. Um, currently, we take the bill and we divide it by what percent we think they use them, and our organizations are good enough to just pay it, luckily. Right. Yeah, I think you've, you've really developed uh, lacrosse, and there are a lot of sports that have really picked up more than... Yep than say 20 years ago, 15 right. years ago and stuff. But yeah, I, I, have, um, I have concerns with the fact that the, uh, you know, and other people have voiced the same one, in that I, I feel like I need to have more information about what this, this phase two is. I mean, it's just like when you're renovating your house, you know, you'd, you'd like to have an overall plan and then you do what you can afford at the time. And right now I'm concerned about what's, what's the next phase. And so for that reason, I, I don't think I can support this at this time. Thank you. Further discussion? Mr. Pacino. Thank you, Mr. Mario. Phil Pacino, Precinct 5. In view of the comments from Mr. Uh, Struble and also Mr. Tuttle, I move that the article be tabled. Uh, do you want it to be tabled or do you want to indefinitely postpone? Tabled just puts it aside temporarily. Okay. That is a non-debatable motion. Is there a second? Second. Okay, all those in favor of laying the, the substance of Article 4 on the table, please raise your hand. Those opposed, and the motion does not carry. Further discussion? Mr. Mon. Jamie Mon, Precinct 4. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, and I apologize if this question's already been asked and answered. I was detained and late arriving. As I read the article, Castine Field is not part of the lighting program, is that correct? Correct. But there currently is lighting on Castine Field, correct? Correct. And it will stay as is? Sure. Uh, just to, you had missed earlier, we had mentioned, uh, Elaine Webb had actually asked a similar question. What we were looking to do is take the lighting on Castine and use the current lights that we're taking down to upgrade those, I would say to a significant degree where the field would have, or that area that we use very much for skating now uh, would be better lit. And just a final comment, if and when we do move to phase two, they are a lot of jurisdictional lands of the Massachusetts Wetland Protection Act within this Birch Meadow field, as we know from our committee work. I was on the planning committee also. Um, so as we move to the next phase, I think it's very important that the Conservation Commission be represented on that, on that planning committee again. Further discussion? Mr. Halsey. I was asked in a very personal way to comment on a letter um, that I wrote and sent. Um, it was not my intention to speak this evening to you about this um, in a very specific way, but I feel that it's necessary for me to speak to everybody this evening. Um, there are two things that I will not apologize for and frankly are shameless about, and that is the support of recreational activities in this town for many reasons. Um, I don't think we have to argue the health and welfare and wonderful things that happen when children, and children not so young, are recreating on the fields that we have. I have a very strong um, love of the fact that we are leaders, frankly, and the demand for recreational opportunities in this town is gigantic and we haven't been able to meet it. And frankly, short of tearing down houses and building fields or acquiring land that's not available, there are really two things that you can do. You can turf something or you can light it. And those are the two things that will expand recreational opportunities in this town. Now, the fact that, you know, I 
was not going to speak tonight is really kind of fundamental to the fact that um, during the time that this came up before the selectmen, I excused myself. And I excused myself not just from a vote, but I excused myself from the room and the discussion. And I did that because many of you that know me know that I have spent the best part of 20 years coaching one sport or another, uh, serving on boards of directors of Reading Youth Baseball, of Reading Babe Ruth, um, working closely with the high school teams, both football and baseball, currently serving on the Friends of Reading High School Baseball as our new coach emerges trying to build a program. So I felt like it might be a little bit inappropriate for me to weigh in given the intense amount of activities that I've had tied to recreation, so I stepped away. But I now can't step away because I've been called out directly to speak to this issue. The second thing that I won't ever apologize for is a call to action among our citizens. I sent a letter out probably a week or 10 days ago. I sent it out to, I believe, eight or nine youth serving organizations in this town who are directly impacted by this discussion and how you vote. And I believe that the best way for us to have a vibrant community is for people to be aware of those issues that come up, when they come up, and to be present to hear, that the peop hear what the people who they've elected to represent them have to say. And so to that end, I'm proud of the fact that I, that I exercised a call to action on a topic that I think is very timely and very important. Um, I also serve on the board of ARCASA. And here's something I know, that the more things we can do to drag our kids out of the basement away from the Xbox, the better off our opportunities to have them make the right turn instead of the wrong turn given that opportunity. And I think that this is one of those things that gives all of us in this room the unique opportunity to send a message that says we want healthy, vibrant things becoming available to the young people in this community. I do think, frankly, that what we have here is a pretty simple question. And it's been brought up by several people, including our town manager. Um, if we want more field space, lighting is one of the ways we can do it. That's what this is about. There are some people that are concerned that we're putting the cart in front of the horse. Frankly, one of the th it, it makes no sense, in my opinion, but I only have one opinion, to mobilize an extended amount of public hearings around something that is, doesn't have the opportunity to get legs. Now, I think what the request here is, is for an authorization to go forward with the financing portion of lighting these fields. And if you'll look, as somebody aptly pointed out, inside the warrant, it couldn't be more clearly stated that that is not the beginning and end. That is the beginning of the public process that's going to allow the selectmen to hear from the neighbors, understand, and work to mitigate the issues that might arise. I can tell you this, that I sat in your chair before I sat in one of these chairs. And generally speaking, what I tried to do was vote in a way that people that had the responsibility and work to complete certain tasks were allowed to do that. So for example, one of the questions here is not only do you want lights, do you trust your Board of Selectmen to work a fair and balanced public process throughout the community? I would submit to you that that is the goal of all of the selectmen that are seated here, all elected from very different disciplines, from very different locations in town, all working on your behalf and on behalf of the rest of the citizens. So I would suggest to you that if you trust that process, I would urge you, as I will, to vote on behalf of this particular warrant. People have not spoken yet in the fire corner. Yes.
Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Erin Calvobachi, Precinct 5. As someone who has played softball and field hockey in this town and now raising three daughters playing soccer and lacrosse, we do have a huge issue with fields. And I urge you to support the lighting because it is something about keeping our children active and safe. Thank you. Further discussion? People have not spoken yet? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Jeff Hansen, Precinct 7, and at the risk of uh, repeating those who uh, support this, um, my experience as a citizen of Reading is that the community agrees we do meet, need more fields. This seems like a very viable solution to, uh, to enable that. Um, I think that's the big picture. It's the details that we really need to work through, the operational procedures, the policies, um, the things that are in question, such as hours of operations and things of that sort. Uh, lastly, um, you ask any small child what their favorite part of Saturday Night Lights is, it's always uh, it's playing under the lights. Further discussion? Yes, right in the middle. Thank you, sir. Uh, Tom Wise, Precinct 3. Um, I'm coming from a baseball game, so I'm not unbiased in my statement. Um, I have, I coach soccer, I coach baseball, my daughter's in softball, so all that there. But John, I have one question for you that I heard at the Board of Selectmen that I'd like to, to, to address. Friday Night Lights or Saturday Night Lights, I understood from the Board of Selectmen meeting in March that we actually had to pay more money to light the softball field during that period of time. Is that correct? Mr. Pudo? Yeah, that, that's actually true. We actually hire, or we rented uh, two banks that you see typically on the highway to, um, bring the fields to, not even adequate, but enough for, so kids could play football. So the reality is we've made a cash expenditure, a one-time cash that's gonna have to come back again this fall most likely because Saturday Night Lights is probably one of the most popular processes we have around town from a sporting perspective. And going forward, that field would be lit. Yeah, that's correct. The other side about this, and we've heard that we have a revenue problem overall in town, while we can't raise fees to pay this debt, I also heard during the Board of Selectmen meeting that between 60 and 140,000, give or take, is sent back from recreation to the town, as it is right now. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. We actually estimate between 75 and 100 over the last few years. Okay, and we are expecting, or you're expecting, or thinking about, that you will raise fees to bring back even more revenue to the town as a result of having more playing fields and a longer period of time to play. Correct. So, long story short, we're getting more light for all the sports that all everybody wants. And theoretically, we should get more revenue from that light to help with the greater revenue problem, even if it is small, $100,000, $150,000, $200,000, may sound like chump change, but when you're trying to get as much as you can, anything revenue positive is a positive thing. Thank you. Further discussion? Okay, there's a hand up in the back, and then we'll come back to all the town meeting members that have spoken before. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jonathan Weber, uh, 84 Hartshorn Street. My lawn doesn't look that good most of the time. Uh, I'm in a butter, and I'm here to tell you that I am completely in favor of this. Um, we moved into that house uh, that you see there in the lower left, uh, basically because that complex is there. And I think any opportunity to get my kids or anybody else's kids out there playing on those fields for a longer period of time is worth it. Uh, I would also state this. Right now we have the tennis courts, for those of you worried about lighting and affecting the neighbors. The tennis courts are on till 10 o'clock at night. The Little League field's on the opposite side of the tennis courts, so you are not going to add any more light coming towards anyone's house. Morton Field is a different discussion, but you've got directional lighting that's going in there, I believe, and there should be no issue there. You get lighting now from the softball fields all the way over to my house, it does not affect the neighbors to the extent where it is a problem. I also believe in the process you've got in place. I believe that the selectmen will do the right thing and have a discussion with the neighbors and make sure this is done properly. I urge you all to vote for this. Thank you. So another hand up the back. Uh, yes, on the far. 
I would ask that you not clap. This, remember, is a legislative body. Right. Uh, Mark Ventura, Precinct 2. Um, I'm also the uh, Director of Fields for Reading Little League. Um, I was nominated and voted in in September 2014. Um, I just uh, want to address a couple concerns. Regarding the noise, um, I live over on Belmont Street. Uh, the only noise I really hear coming from that complex is the marching band during the football games. And that just reminds me, hey, grab the kids, go to the football game. Um, it's fantastic. I don't hear really any other noise. Um, I think the last gentleman just addressed the lighting spillover concerns. Um, I do have a civil engineering background. Um, any new lighting should come with a proper photometrics plan, um, which should ensure that there should be no spillover onto the abutters. Um, and if you've played in the fields, um, I played in the uh, men's softball league a few years ago before, uh, before my twins, <laughs> and uh, I started coaching and everything else. Um, lighting stuff out there, it is a safety concern. Um, also, uh, Little League uh, maintains four out of the uh, five fields we play at, uh, we maintain the infields. Um, this was a decision um, by Reddy Youth Baseball in the town because we use a different type of clay many years ago. Um, we maintain those. Um, so we're investing into the community, into these fields. Uh, the tennis court field improvement project is nearing completion, a few punch list items, a couple little items to finish up. Uh, we've invested $34,000 into the tennis court field. Uh, we also have a company coming in to rebuild four out of the five fields that we play at at a cost of $10,000. We also do per periodic maintenance throughout the year on these fields. Um, the numbers are up. Talk to the Little League parents. Look at our uh, number of youth players we have in the program. Um, it, it's, it's huge now. Uh, we need the field space. Uh, this would definitely ben benefit us, benefit the community. Uh, I'd really like to see this move forward. Um, I mean, what would be better than watching a Little League game under the lights? Um, this whole winter, the long winter, uh, March, April, um, I forged a lot of relationships in this community. I grew up in this community. I played at these fields when I was a kid. I'm back in this community, I'm playing on the fields again. Um, there's an excitement in the air uh, about baseball now, as well as other sports, lacrosse, et cetera. Um, and I really think we need to move forward with this project. Um, Reading Little League is investing in this community, uh, both with the children and, you know, physical items like field improvements and maintenance. Um, I'd like to see the community invest in Reading Little League. Thank you. And Ms. O'Neill. Mary Ellen O'Neill, Precinct 4. Um, I also want to speak about another um, age group, and that is the preschool group and the, and the infants and young children um, who also need park space to play in. <clears throat> We've lost the Imagination Station, um, which was a great resource to this town. Um, I've lost my neighborhood park since last July. Uh, provision was made to fence off the baseball field, so that could be used, but the tot lot and a, a lovely shaded area that's walkable to, on my side of the town where there is no other public park, um, no such provision was made for that, and that's not been able to be used since last July. Um, so it's not an either or, but it's to keep in mind that there's lots of ways of providing recreation. And while I do support this complex, and I'd like to see a great plan for it and have it well used and have kids out of the house, there are other things to do in town, and we also need to support those. It, so I'm a little concerned about how this got cherry-picked out now, and I hear that there's live bids, I don't know how that happened, um, where there's also other concerns. So to me, it's an idea of a community setting priorities, and uh, thank you for listening. So our hand over here, oh yeah, Mr. Downing. Jack Downing, Precinct 7 again. Um, I just uh, am a little disappointed that the selectmen seem to feel that you would rather spend first the taxpayers' million dollars 
then have a discussion with the neighbors. In other words, what I heard from you, Mr. Rensminger, is that you think that you don't want to have that meeting. You don't want to bother to do it until you know that the money is going to be uh, there. Please, you're and getting a little personal. No, 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 no. I'm not trying to be personal. Well, just watch what you're saying. I think the selectman who put this on the warrant should have had the responsibility to discuss this first with the neighbors and to have a general discussion of phase two so we know what we're voting for before we take the money from the taxpayers. It's, it's the million dollars plus the interest. And how hard would it be for you to have a one-hour meeting? I, that's my point. And I think we'll, again, have the cart before the horse. Thank you. Mr. Arena. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Arena, Precinct 1. This did come before the Board of Selectmen, and it was discussed. Um, this is a capital investment. It's part of our master plan. Like any other object in the master plan, it's subject to change. But it's already known to the public, and we pull things forward and push them out based on capital, priorities, and other objectives. Unlike other items in the master plan, this one is self-financing. We have an opportunity here to spend debt and have it paid back after 10 years. And whether we intend to roll back the discount or keep prices as they are at that point in time is our discretion. But unlike any, many other plans, many other projects, this one is actually self-financing. It's a more time for the members and citizens of the town of Reading, greater opportunities for kids to become uh, active in something other than an iPad or some other destructive behavior. And it's a project that pays for itself. But to the assertion that somehow this is a uh, cart before horse, this is the way all projects in the master plan happen. We'll have the, you have, you've heard from other members of the board, I'll echo the sentiments. The discussions with the abutters will happen. The regulatory process that dictates the amount of time, the amount of hours, the, et cetera, will happen. This is a question if you want to renovate the existing lighting on the field, to go from three fields to five and put in more energy efficient lighting that has less spillover for the existing fields. It's, in some sense, kind of, an, in, in that sense, rather ordinary. What I'm hearing primarily is objections to how it'll be used, and that's the subject of forthcoming discussions. But to the central assertion this hasn't been brought forward, I categorically deny it. It's not true. The Board of Selectmen has had this discussion. It have been public discussions, um, and there'll be more. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Charles Stanley Moran, Precinct 7. A uh, couple questions, uh, and this follows up a uh, previous speaker. Uh, the Little League field, is that only used by Little League, or is it used by other groups? Uh, good question. In general, it's used by Little League Baseball. Okay. It's been defined as a Little League field. Okay. Uh, so that you know, it wouldn't be used in the fall for soccer practice or something like that? Uh, it could be. We wouldn't close the door to putting anything on there. It actually is on a request basis. If Reading Youth Softball wanted to use it, for instance, they would be given the opportunity. Okay. And is there much fall baseball and softball going on, or is that pretty much uh, a spring and uh, summertime activity? Uh, basically, every sport is all three seasons, some are even indoors. Um, so there's less spring baseball than there is, uh, I'm sorry, less fall baseball than there is spring, but we have a pretty robust Pop Warner program, and we have a pretty robust uh, so, uh, fall soccer program. So across the board, the fields are booked pretty much spring, summer, and fall. Oh, okay, but uh, so even though it's called Little League, Field. We titled it, you can kind of ignore, we, we actually, okay. this needs to be another discussion another time of naming these fields. Okay. Uh, we just put that up there to, to f differentiate between the Little League and the uh, larger, side, more, okay. larger size Morton okay. Field. And uh, Morton Field, uh, I believe that's pretty much just used by the high school baseball team and or is it used by other teams, and what other teams? Yep, Morton Field is actually used in a couple of different ways. It's used by Reading High School Baseball, it's used by Reading uh, Babe Ruth, but it's also used by Reading High School Field Hockey as a practice field. Okay, good. And uh, Morton Field, it's my understanding that in terms of the baseball fields and our community, that was the premier 
quality field, you know, in terms of uh, the condition of the field uh, because it was being used a little bit less than uh, like the softball fields? Uh, I think actually they're all used about the same. I think they're used to their max. We don't spend a lot of time resting fields anymore. Uh, we don't have that luxury. So when the high school baseball team's not using it, it's being used by Babe Ruth. Uh, there's a pretty intensive maintenance program for that program that's not extended to the other two uh, larger 90-foot diamonds. And that's just for practicality and, and cost purposes. It's done privately. They just don't have the wherewithal to do all three fields. I think if they could, they would. Okay. And uh, uh, sorry to repeat uh, another comment. Uh, town meeting members' comments. I am concerned about the condition of the field, and if you increase the use of the fields, we're gonna end up with uh, the con field conditions similar to what soccer experiences at Coolidge, Simons, uh, and the Pearl Street, uh, as an example. It used to be a wonderful field 12 years ago when my oldest was using it, uh, but by the time my youngest got there, it's terrible. You know, rocky, hard-packed, uh, and, you know, partially because you can't rest the field, but, you know, if you light it, you, you increase your use, you know, the condition is going to deteriorate unless we invest, uh, you know, in aggressive aeration and fertilization and, you know, then there's concern about all the chemicals. So, uh, you know, I'm concerned. Thank you. Further discussion? Mr. D'Addario? Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Ron Dario, Precinct 6. Just a point of information just before I speak. Mr. Moderator, if, uh, if I would have tabled some of this, could I speak first and then do it, or is it if you table No, it tabling first? is um, non-debatable. We've already had a motion no, to I table that has failed. Okay. Yeah. All right. Here's Ron Dario, Precinct 6. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Here's kind of my take. Uh, <clears throat> you know, I, uh, one of my daughters was an athlete at the high school, and I, some of the best time I had was coaching girl, girl softball. I got to admit that. But I have a hard time. My hard time is sort of this. Uh, we're eight precincts, and uh, it's easy for seven precincts to, stone, to kind of stonewall one precinct. But we, we feel it's a good thing to do. So we, we got the votes. We have seven precincts, so precinct seven, they're just going to have to suck it up. I don't live in precinct seven. The only thing I hear is the band, and I enjoy that, mo I enjoy that most of the time. But I do have a hard time. Now, I know there are probably pe people here in precinct seven that after you hear the, um, the intense wishes of our athletic community about the need for this, it's kind of hard maybe to get up and speak against it because it sounds like maybe you're selfish or you know you want to do what's best for the majority of kids and this certainly seems like the best thing to do but I still have a problem I have a problem voting not having that precinct well I guess I would say to all of you let's say you lived there near the softball field, uh, near the Little League field to be. Okay, I mean, how would you feel? Are you okay with it? Um, I don't know, you know, maybe I wouldn't be okay with it. Maybe I, I, maybe I would suck it up. Uh, once we vote for the money, it is kind of a done deal. That why, that's why I was thinking of maybe tabling it. It's probably, I was wondering if we tabled it and Precinct 7 could do some investigating and for people who live around there and come back Thursday. That was just a thought. I would have an easier time of it. So I'm kind of torn. Thank you. So I hand up the back, the back row, yes. Peter Kasher, Precinct 3, I move we vote on the issue. 
We have a motion to um, uh, end debate. That requires a two-thirds vote. Is there a second? Second. Uh, let's see, we need counters. Mr. Brown, would you do the honors for the, um, my right and the um, Finance Committee? Mr. Crook, would you take the center right? Mr. Rushworth, would you take the center left? And uh, Ms. Russell, would you take the left and the Board of Selectmen? Now, this is a vote to end debate. All those in favor of ending debate, please uh, rise. Mr. Rushworth? 36. 36. Mr. Crook? 23. 23. 39. 42. And those opposed to ending debate? Three. 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 Six. 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 The vote being 140 in the affirmative and 18 in the negative, the question has been moved. We will now proceed to a vote on the main motion, which is also, re also requires a two-thirds vote. So again, I'd ask the same counters. All those in favor of the motion, please rise. Twenty-eight. Twenty-eight. Fourteen. Fourteen. Thirty-seven. Thirty-six. Thirty-six. And those opposed, please rise. Six. Six. Ten. Ten. Fifteen. Fifteen. Twelve. Twelve. Forty-three. The vote being 130, uh, excuse me, 115 in the uh, affirmative and 43 in the negative, the motion carries. Business under Article 5, Mr. LaLasher. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. <clears throat> this article uh, in front of you now, Article 5, um, came about for two reasons, but there's only one reason left. What, did I say something? <laughs> <laughs> I remember the clap of thunder a couple of years ago. Um, the school department conducted a first round of bids, and they had an indication that a million two might not be sufficient. Happily, they had a second round of bids, and a million two is just fine. Um, so what in front of you is, is really very simple. Just like the last question, it's just a yes-no question. Um, <laughs> if you think we should use free cash, vote no. If you think we should use debt, vote yes. I'll give you a little more, though. There's a lot of new town meeting members. I thought a quick lesson in the town's financial philosophy was in order. The first rule we go by is you don't really need it. The second rule is you get it for free somewhere. You wouldn't believe how this is ingrained in, in me, at least, after 10 years. And then the third one is, if you do have to actually pay for it, make someone hurt. <laughs> when you do have to pay for it, there's three ways. The first way, and this is why I love the MWRA, uh, you borrow at 0% interest rates, which means that for 10 years, you only have to pay 10% of the total cost a year. That's great. Uh, second one, use free cash. That way, you're not paying any interest on the debt. And that usually works in the ballpark of what this project was, a million dollars or so. And the last choice is use debt, and particularly when you use debt, generally speaking, you want to use as short of maturities as possible. Um, the reason this article um, continues is I have an interest in converting this use to debt. Um, you'll see uh, on Thursday, at this point, it looks like we're going to ask for $850,000 of free cash to be used for the snow and ice deficit. Now, it turns out we had some of the surpluses, so we don't actually need all that amount. We need about 600,000. But that was certainly not something we planned on when winter started. 
Uh, and parenthetically, that's actually not a bad number for our region. There's communities that are in the whole more than a million dollars that are smaller than us, and they don't have the free cash. <clears throat> um, it just as a, as a parenthetical note in your budget books, in your, in your town meeting warrant reports, the FinCom budget used a million five just in case. So all the budgeting, all the planning um, has a million five in here. Um, and is, has been mentioned in the last article, we're already doing a debt issue, so this is a reasonably simple thing to convert. So I think that's all. It really is a really simple question. Someone asked me for a recap of free cash. Uh, last July 1st, we had eight and a half million dollars. Uh, we've been spending like drunken sailors since then, so we're down to about four and a half million. Um, if you vote to finance this with debt, it'll be a little higher, it'll be a little under six million. And then, um, as was mentioned in the state of the town, and as will be mentioned if we ever get to the financial state of the town, um, we do regenerate money every year. And as a bare minimum, it's 750000 For the last several years, it's been a couple million. So if we regenerate a couple million and convert this project to debt, um, we'll be in reasonably good shape. We'll still be above FinCom's 5%. Thank you. FinCom report. Ms. Herrick. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, on March 25th, this came back before FinCom, and um, we voted 800 to um, urge you to uh, consider authorizing debt to finance this. And I'd just like to say that this was one of those projects that came up before us rather quickly. It came before FinCom in our last financial forum. And at that time, I was quite concerned, and I can relate to the drunken sailor um, analogy. I was quite concerned that we were going to use free cash. So I am, I'm thrilled that we're converting this to debt. It's a long-term project. It's where it should be. Thanks. Further discussion? Yes, Mr. Uh, Berman. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Barry Berman, Board of Selectmen in Precinct 4. I, I um, support using debt for this for a number of reasons. One is um, when we did the little survey before about what's the sort of right amount of free cash, most people voted around 5%. Um, we were at 7, 8, and sometimes maybe even 9%. And, and one of the benefits of that is that we're able to get a bond rating of AAA, which is now enabling us to borrow money at 1.5%. Now, I know it's not zero, which is what the MBRA does, but it's as close to zero as you're going to get. So by keeping the free cash high, we're able to borrow low and to do projects that allow us to keep, to be able to do this project and maybe another one because we did the discipline over the past few years. So now we can do this and 1.5%, I know it's not free, but it's as close as we're ever going to get. So um, I support the motion to do it as, a, as debt rather than free cash, keeping the free cash higher so we can kind of figure out over the next year how we're going to deal with the services that we need and how we're going to pay for them and not to draw the free cash down to the point where we're forced to make decisions prematurely. Thank you. Further discussion? None appearing. Are we ready for the vote? This requires a two-thirds vote, but we'll try a hand count first. All those in favor, please raise your hand. And the, the opposed? Uh, none appearing. It is unanimous. Business under Article 6. Dr. Doherty. Good evening, town meeting members. Uh, we want to give you some background information on Article 6 um, involving the retaining wall. Uh, the location of the retaining wall actually is right directly through this exit door adjacent um, across from the Fine and Performing Arts Center. It's located in the um, southwest edge of the, the parking lot. And what we discovered um, in August, the, uh, our building inspector was doing the routine before the school year checks of our, our buildings and, and grounds and um, noticed that there had been some considerable shift occurring in that part of the, uh, the retaining wall here at the high school. Um, we did some preliminary analysis, our facilities department. In November, we uh, came to town meeting, requested some funding to do a more detailed analysis 
of what it would cost to, to replace um, the wall or to repair the wall. Um, what we in town meeting approved that funding. Um, and then over the last few months, and unfortunately snow has gotten in the way of uh, getting the cost estimate sooner, um, through that cost analysis, uh, we've come up with an amount that will replace this whole section of, of, the, uh, of the retaining wall. And also to replace the upper part of the parking lot that is adjacent to the wall. So we're gonna go into this in a little bit more detail. So I'm gonna show you several pictures here of, the, of what you see. Um, the, uh, the design company, that uh, the engineering company that, that looked into this was Par Engineering. So you can see here that you, in, this is the actual photo, you see some buckling here of the wave-like of, of the wall itself. Um, you also see where you have the, um, the tubes going into the actual cement. Because there's been failure and shifting of the actual wall, it's causing cracks along the, the sidewalk area um, that's, that's above on top of the wall. Also see when you're taking a look down the side of the wall, you can see there, there's also some buckling. This should be a straight line, and there, that straight line is, is um, very wavy. Um, this is probably the most telling sign what you see um, is that should actually be flush with the, with the actual brick wall, and um, as you can see, it is not. It's actually sticking out. Um, and the good news about this, though, is that the stairs itself will not have to be replaced, which it would have been a much higher cost. So what we're talking about is just the actual wall itself. So the recommendations by the um, company, the engineering company, is to remove uh, and rebuild the entire southwest retaining wall from the stairs to the pack entrance. So the entire wall, when you're looking out um, from, the, from the school, it's the wall to the right of the stairs, everything to the right of the stairs. Um, repairing also the sidewalk and the parking lot that are adjacent to the wall itself. There is also some additional funding that has been put into um, the requested amount in case that there is some contaminated soil uh, from the removal of the wall, and they need to go further in and replace more of the parking lot. Um, it is also going to take an estimated eight to ten weeks, so the cost also includes um, the, uh, the time on site for construction supervision. So a breakdown of the cost that you see here. Um, the actual construction cost is uh, about $337,000. The construction administration, which is an estimated amount based on an 8, 10, 10 week projected schedule, is about $60,000. And then the, the potential add-ons, which is close to another $98,000, $99,000, is if more of the parking lot has to be replaced, um, depending on when they start digging into the wall, if there's any other uh, contamination or analysis that has to be done. Bringing the cost to about $500,000. So again, the recommendation would be to, um, to request for the $500,000, um, which should cover us in case of any, any different contingencies. Um, the estimated project would be about eight to 10 weeks, which we'd be doing during the summer months. In time for the start of school, the wall will be completely um, rebuilt. The other thing about the wall is that the design is going to be changed with the wall. The current design is more of a 90 degree angle that's going to be more of a stair-like design similar to the wall to the left um, of the stairwell um, looks like now. And then certainly the next steps is to be getting the um, request here from town meeting um, and then moving forward with the proper development of the, of the bid. Vincom report, Mr. Mary. The Finance Committee recommended this meeting, uh, excuse me, recommended this article by a vote of 7-0-0 at the meeting prior to tonight's town meeting. There's further discussion, Mr. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Bill Brown, Precinct 8. 
as one who walked the project just, just about every day when that was being built. Uh, I don't think there's any drains above that, John, which also helps uh, create the thing. Uh, there was also, I noted there's no weep holes in that, which also does not help the film. I hope that when you guys do this, you tie into some of the present drains or make uh, way you get rid of the water. If it doesn't move out of the thing, it's going to freeze and push that wall out again. Further the discussion? Yes, up on the back. Tony Tor from Precinct One. Have we uh, exhausted all the possibilities of the, uh, the architect, the engineer, the uh, site engineers who signed off on this thing? Was it built to spec or was it built wrong? Have we gone to, through that process? I, I heard the contractor's out of business. You're talking about the original building of the wall? Yes. In 2007, I believe. Right. Um, that's a great question. Um, we've been in contact with the legal counsel that we've been working with uh, on past experiences with the construction company that worked on this project and unfortunately we have exhausted that because the timeline is too long between the time that the wall was built and now. Further discussion? Follow up Mr. Torre? Mr. Torre, do you have a follow up? I guess my, my question was more geared towards whether it was, if it was designed wrong or built wrong. Uh, and, and the engineers, you know, there's other people involved, but there's still, a, you know, I don't know if there's a statute of limitations on it being done wrong from the beginning, whether the guy's out of business or not. There's a lot of principles involved. That's, you know. No, and we, we have looked into that. Unfortunately, we're beyond that, that time frame. Mr. Munn. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jamie Mon, Precinct 4. Along those same lines, that wall was rebuilt a couple of times because it was built incorrectly and TNT Construction had to come back and rebuild it and they did it wrong and it's still wrong. Seven years for a retaining wall is, is unacceptable. I think part of the problem we had previously was that we were forced to select the construction company that came in at the lowest bid. Are we forced to do that with this bid also? If I can, if I can ask the first, answer the first part of your question, um, this part of the wall was never rebuilt. Maybe it should have been. It was this, it was this part of the wall that was rebuilt. Just well, to clarify well, I think that. maybe that points to the problem. If they did a poor job twice Correct. on part of the wall, we hindsight is, is 2020. We should have been more critical of the wall that's there, but hopefully we can use that 2020 hindsight looking forward and not have the same problem and have our engineering department as well as the engineer uh, as part of the resident inspection to make sure that this is designed and constructed correctly because spending half a million dollars on a seven-year retaining wall is unacceptable. We, you look around town, you see retaining walls that are 100 years old, and, and they're sturdy. So this is disappointing. Further discussion? Mr. Weld? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Carl Weld, Precinct 7. I'm sure our outstanding new legal counsel is crafting a contract that is going to protect us much better than we have been protect, uh, un, left unprotected in, with this last deal, correct? <laughs> Further discussion? Yes, Mr. Downing. Jack Downey from uh, Precinct 7. I have to agree with um, Mr. Mon that whole, I guess you'd call it the left side of the wall, the larger retaining wall, was completely rebuilt by TNT because it was falling over the day they built it. Um, 
And it, they probably needed to do the right, but in retrospect, the left wall looks so much more dangerous that obviously that's what was rebuilt. But I had a specific question. You had $7,500 contingency in there for LSP services, and this is all engineered fill that was backfilled behind the wall um, at the time of construction. If we didn't have an LSP at that time, why would we need one now? Car engineering um, put in a contingency for LSP just because they weren't sure once they began excavating and they removed the wall. No one's really sure what the prior contractor may have put in there. So they put in a small contingency just in the off chance that maybe they were to find something. Just so you know, that's Kelly Cologne. She's the director of facilities. Huh, thank you. <laughs> Further discussion? Yes, Mr. Donald Moran. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Charles Stanley Moran, Precinct 7. And I have no idea as to what the answer is to this question that I'm asking. Is it possible to get an insurance policy on this project? And if so, how much might it cost? So that, you know, in eight years, if it fails, we're not faced with a large bill if we've got insurance on it? Thank you. Do we have a response? No. Okay, further discussion? Mr. Brown? Brown again. Um, the fill in behind it is the stuff that came down off the 1954 building. Further discussion? Oh, further discussion? Yes. Uh, thank you, Bruce McKenzie, Precinct 8. Um, following up on Jamie Mon's 100 year retaining walls, this doesn't really apply for this repair because the wall is, you know, sandwiched between a a, a road in a parking lot, but I ask town officials, whenever possible, plan for the far distant future. Um, 50 or 100 or 200 years from now, the, um, the town finances may be a wreck, the economy might be bad, you know, there's no telling what happens. The steel fences above the retaining walls are going to rot away, and we might not be able to replace them, but the wall will still be there, and kids are going to fall. So wherever possible, when you're making new retaining walls, please terrace them so that a child or an animal won't fall too far. And this especially applies to the um, Jordan furniture. That would be a very dangerous wall to go down. Um, and it doesn't always take a lot of space. For example, we have a um, handicap ramp that zigzags over beyond the steps. That, that part will not be rebuilt. But if that handicap ramp had gone at an angle upward, then the retaining wall would be less dangerous. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes, right on the edge. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jeff Hansen, Precinct 7. Um, I, there's a number of pretty big projects that are going on at our schools with the modular classrooms, with, I think, roof repairs. Uh, this is in reference to the construction administration costs. I believe I read that there's going to be a project manager hired for the modular classrooms and the other ones. Is there a way that we can utilize that resource to cover some of the expense that's been allocated here for project management? The, the reason, I'll, I'll speak to the modular. The reason why we're, we're doing the, con, the administration for the modules is because we're going to be in three different sites. So that, that administration is to oversee the, the project for the three different sites. In terms of, of this wall project, I don't know if you want to talk about it. Kelly Cologne. Um, project administration for this, this is a public works civil engineering project and the, the contract administration, the construction administration would be relative to that specific project. They wouldn't be in tandem with the modulars. It would be a completely separate project. Further discussion? Yes, I'm on the edge. Thank you, Ken Tucci, Precinct 8. Did the uh, engineering folks give you an estimation of how long this one should last? <laughs> we have estimates of somewhere between 15 and 20 years before we would even have to look at anything with this wall, based on the new design. And, and how are we going to assure that? And I think the town meeting member who asked the question of the council if there was any way to um, 
help ensure that? I think that was a reasonable question that should deserve an answer. Off you go. Town Council. Well, just to be clear, um, when it was mentioned before that legal counsel told, that was not me. No, no. Okay. I'm sure saying that. Okay, that we've just to be clear. Uh, but the, the information that the other legal counsel provided is actually right. Uh, okay, so, uh, so um, there's, only, well, there's a limit to what you can write into a contract. There, there is a statute of limitations, um, which is three years for defects in construction or design. And then there's something called a statute of repose, which says that the statute of limitations is told until for a period beginning when the town takes possession of the thing that's being constructed and goes for six years. So the reason we can't pursue the old uh, contractor is because that six year period is passed. Um, I'm good, but I can't write anything around that. So basically, if we believe that there's a defect in the, in the construction of the wall, of the new wall, we have to find it and take action on it within six years of whenever we took possession, we take possession of the wall. That's the law, I can't draft something around it. Further discussion? Is there a hand? Nope, are we ready for a vote? Okay, this requires a two thirds vote. Again, we'll try a hand count first. All those in favor, please raise your hand. And those opposed? And we will be taking a standing count. Can I ask my counters? Uh, all those in favor, please rise. Twenty-one. Oh, excuse me, uh, Mr. Crook. Twenty-one. Twenty-one. Mr. Rushworth. Thirty. Thirty. Forty-six. That's forty-three. Forty-three. I'm sorry. Forty-three. And what was that? Zero. Zero. All those opposed. Oh, what? Excuse me. Oh, zero. Thirty-two in favor, Mr. Moderator. I'm sorry. Oh, thirty-two. Yeah. Oh, was that you? The okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Those opposed. Zero. 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 The vote being 126 in the affirmative, zero in the negative, the motion carries. Business under Article 7, Mr. LaLasher. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, in your packets, you don't have a lot of information, but uh, Town Council has developed a motion for tonight. Um, the Board of Selectmen met in executive session with Town Council a week or so ago and uh, developed a strategy to settle the litigation. First, I want to ask a quick, quick question. Is anyone here born in Kansas? Okay, well, these folks we're dealing with are, and um, they've been very difficult to get their attention focused on the fact that we have a town meeting and we needed a decision for tonight. So what town council is asking you to do is, um, and this is a little sensitive because it still is executive session, but we have offered the dollar figure that's behind me as settling the suit. So if town meeting would be good enough to approve that settlement, um, we don't need authorization for any amount 25,000 and lower. We can do that. But for any amount over 25,000, we need town meeting's authorization. Um, I have no idea if 27,000 will settle the suit. They certainly asked for a great deal more. But we gave them every opportunity through today to respond and counter if they would. Um, so at this point, um, I would like to ask your indulgence to pass this motion as stated for the dollar figure and the June 30th. And if they won't settle for that dollar figure within June 30th, then hard luck on them. 
We have a FinCom report? No, no FinCom report. Okay. Further discussion? Not appearing. Are we ready for the vote? Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Mon. Jamie Mon, Precinct 4. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Could you give us a little background on this? Sure. Where is the site? What's the litigation? Um, I'll, I'll give you a little, but it is executive session, so I want to be careful in case the Kansas folks are watching. Um, many, many years ago, in the, in the 1960s, uh, the place called Rocco's Landfill was found to be contaminated. And for some period of time, less than three years, let's say a year plus, the town sent some of its trash to this landfill, or the hauler we had put trash in the landfill. The landfill was later found um, by the EPA to have contamination. It's a super fun site. The big pockets, if you will, um, were all sued. That case is finished. This is now a second round case where all the larger corporations primarily are reaching out to anyone they can find to try to pass along some of the, that pain of settlement. So where it is factually true that the town did send some of its trash to this landfill, no one can prove whether we had contaminated trash or not, but there's all kinds of formulas um, that the AP ha APA has to determine rough liability. So town council has used that in order to come up with this figure. So we do know that the town of Reading did put some amount of trash in that landfill for some amount of time. Um, you know, the other side wants to stretch the math and invent some of their own to come up with a larger figure. Uh, this figure, you know, is, is a statistical figure. It's not just picked out of the sky. It's based on EPA guidelines. Is that, is that enough, Jamie? Okay. Further discussion? Mr. Pacino? Yeah. Phil Pacino, Precinct 5, just one question. I know at the light department we had a similar case like this and we got kept getting sued and sued and sued because we filed the correct paperwork. Is this the end or is there potentially more litigation that could result from this? Mr. Lasher. <coughs> I would say if they accept this, it'll be the end. But if they don't, I'm sure it won't be the end. If, if town meeting remembers, we came to you at a prior town meeting, one of those other specials, and tabled this article because, again, we had taken a a running start at settling, and since then they've lowered their demands, but they hadn't responded this time. So there's just no telling. They may settle this for this amount by June, or they may come back. Further discussion? None appearing. Are we ready for the vote? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. Dr. Ensminger moves that we adjourn this town meeting, this special town meeting, sine die. Is there a second? Oh, excuse me. Oh, second, okay. <laughs> Um, all those in favor of adjournment, please raise your hand. Those opposed? Special town meeting stands adjourned, signing die. We now bring the annual town meeting back into order. We have a motion to adjourn until Thursday evening. Oh, before we... Okay. Uh, all right. I, I accept that, but uh, is there a second? Second. Just a quick announcement before I take that vote. The town manager has asked that we... Uh, put the budget off until Monday and try to plow through what we've already started on the, uh, the regular meeting, but we'll discuss that on Thursday. All those in favor of adjournment, please raise your hand. Those opposed, motion carries. This annual town meeting stands adjourned till Thursday. <laughs>